Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fifth and final day of the 2022 National Coding Symposium. We are so glad you're here to join us. Hopefully you've caught one, if not all, of our days this week. If you have not, they are all being recorded, so you are welcome as soon as they get posted. Should take about a week to two weeks to get all of them up and captioned. You're welcome to stop back in and see them. We have lots of people joining us. We have teachers, we have students, we have adults who just are interested in coding. So we have something special specific for our teachers, though so you're welcome to grab one if you want as well. We have opening and closing code words. The opening and closing code words are submitted to um, a website at the APH Hive. So if you're also looking for other professional development, that's our asynchronous learning platform. You could go there as well. But they are submitted to get a certificate for ACVREP credit, which is continuing education credits for people who want to recertify. Our opening code today is internet. I-N-T-E-R-N-E-T. -E -E Our opening code today is internet. So hold on to that. Wait until the end of today, about three hours from now, and grab the closing code and then submit those. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to submit from an uh, earlier day, realize that that is available for 30 days only. And after that, you will no longer be able to submit for credit. Okay, it's been a whirlwind. We are working on getting our keynote speaker in as well as our panelists in. So stay tuned. Uh, Adrian, why don't I turn it over to you for a moment? Thank you, Liam. I appreciate it. I, uh, I, as, as Liam just said, we're given a moment to bring everybody into this Zoom space. Uh, it is Friday of five days of fantastic of this coding symposium. Um, for those of you, oh, and I'm in 2021, come on, I can't even get the right, the right virtual background and I'm talking in the coding symposium. <laughs> but yeah, somehow I'm going to ramble and change that while I talk. All right, we're in 2022. For those of you who were not aware, we ran this coding symposium for the first time ever last year. Uh, Craig Metter joined us on the first day and explained that our original vision of this symposium was in person. Um, we had planned on bringing people together in California uh, at and around the California School for the Blind for a week of opportunity, engaging with code, engaging with professional blind and low vision coders and programmers, uh, visiting Silicon Valley campuses. Um, and then the pandemic hit and the symposium got uh, got better. It got better with reach. It got better with, um, with availability and accessibility to everyone everywhere. Uh, the first year we hit, I think it was 47 or 48 states and many, many different countries of participants. So if you're joining us from outside of California, um, I can say officially, we're glad we failed at our original vision of having it only in person in California. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for this change uh, that we made and we will continue to envision how it can continue to be hands-on in the future um, while also being um, while also having this digital aspect of, of a virtual space that everyone is available to. Uh, speaking of that hands-on element, if you haven't yet checked out our National Coding Symposium website, you can go to the Connect Center. Uh, you can easily search for National Coding Symposium on Google. It will pop up quick. Um, but once you get to the aphconnectcenter.org slash coding, you can find a resources tab and in that resources tab, you will find the activities that were referenced throughout this week. So if you haven't yet looked at them, that is okay. If, you have, if you're fortunate enough to have Code Jumper uh, in your school district or available to you at a center, uh, there is a lesson plan on Code Jumper. There's also a lesson plan on Code Quest. Uh, Code Quest is a free app in the iOS store for iPads um, that is available uh, with these lesson plan activities associated from our page. There's also an HTML activity. Those of you who joined us on Tuesday, we talked about HTML and had panelists uh, discuss that access to ju not just that activity, but the power of HTML. Uh, while HTML is not always the popular code talked about by programmers, it is, it is the root of access on the internet. 
Um, everything we see is tied in with HTML online. Um, yes, oh, two days ago on Wednesday, we talked about Quorum. Uh, Quorum is an exciting language that uh, was written uh, with, with screen reader access in mind. Um, and so not only was is the integrated development environment completely accessible, um, but the, the, the language within the code uh, tried to be as straightforward as possible. And so um, discussions within Quorum, or I should say semantics within Quorum, um, are very specific to what they actually do. Um, it's, an, it's a neat opportunity and a free space online. And again, we have activities to get teachers of the visually impaired started or any of you started uh, to follow along with. But the idea is you do not need to have experience with code to follow these activities. And then yesterday we dealt with the snake. Uh, so if any of you were here yesterday, we talked about Python um, and those Python activities are up on our website too. I can say from a teacher's perspective uh, and a coding novice perspective, but these, these spaces are intimidating. Um, they, when, you, when you first say, oh, I'm gonna go start Quorum or I'm gonna start Python, Personally, I get I get nervous. Uh, I started learning Python for the first time ever, and the very first page that I was working on, I was like, I, I paused and I almost shut down, shut off my computer. Like, oh, I'll do Python another day. Uh, and it, you get over that hump, you get over that initial difficulty. Um, the learning curve is slow or fast, depending mostly on your own attention and your perseverance and your interest. Um, but our intention of getting you started is that once you find the code that engages you and excites you, you will take it further yourself. Um, we're not here to create the future employees of Google or Microsoft or Verizon, should our keynote come in here in a moment, um, but we're here to inspire you to use your technology a little bit better and consider and recognize that coding is a career choice that you might choose to use um, as a blind or low vision student or adult. Um, career changes are possible. I'm going to do a quick check in in the chat. I don't want to be rambling over our keynote speaker who I see is coming in. Fantastic. Um, quick check in with Leanne and Denise. Do we, is it someone other than myself introducing Kasai? I believe it is. So, Kasai, you have access to your microphone. I'm hoping you can turn on your camera so that I could highlight. Okay. Just, nope, no problem. All right, fantastic, you guys. We have, um, I'm going to take that as a lead. I did not hear that somebody else was on for introductions. Please interrupt me if someone at APH already planned to introduce Kasaya. Going once, going twice. So Kasaya, I'm going to ask you if you would just tilt your camera down just a tiny bit. Perfect. All right, I, uh, I referenced Verizon a moment ago about Kasaya Timmons, and uh, I have to admit I will self-correct myself as the world of technology moves at a clip that uh, I certainly can't keep up with. Um, Kasaya Timmons is the Principal Technical Program Manager. Um, oh, and the CHE Engineering PMO, are you kidding me? We're throwing double acronyms into a title? Uh, we're going to have to have her tell us what those are, of Yahoo! Um, not no longer Verizon, I believe those are tied together in a way um, of, of purchases, but we'll have that in a moment. Uh, she has, Kasaya Timmons has 15 years of experience in accessibility, project management, and consulting. Um, she's worked in a variety of sectors in corporate, government, and nonprofit organizations. Um, and she's currently this principal technical program manager at Yahoo. Um, I think that looking at what she does with Yahoo as a team and mainstream media, but also in working with the accessibility team um, at Yahoo to, to work on their, their bug program and work on their fixes to make their, their sector of the internet accessible was a huge draw for us to get Kasaya involved in this National Coding Symposium. Um, and then we invited her to the 2021 Symposium and Kasaya, you were awesome and amazing. And it was a no brainer that you were on the first call list uh, to invite back and participate this year. And so uh, speaking on, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for coming. We're looking forward to your keynote address. And I know that you will inspire many of our audience members, which are many students, uh, middle school, high school, 
uh, college, uh, many adults that have joined us that are looking towards technology and coding as possibilities of their future. Um, and are looking for a sneak peek of motivation from somebody who's who's related and affiliated in this field and work works in the technology sector. So thank you very much for coming. Kasaya, the floor is yours. Oh, you are currently muted. Do a double check on Zoom, everybody. Make sure we're squared. Still muted, Kasaya. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you coming in perfectly. Okay. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that introduction. Um, yes, uh, <laughs> I'm Kasaya Timmons. I'm the principal technical program manager with Yahoo. Uh, we are no longer affiliated with Verizon. Um, so it's it's wonderful to be here. Um, today, I said a lot uh, with the when I set my title of principal technical program manager. Um, what does a program a technical program manager do? I work with teams to not only hold them accountable for their work, um, but make sure that they release products, web and app products on time and within specifications. Um, so my career path to Yahoo, I did do some accessibility work previously, um, but I've been promoted in a sense. And now I work, I actually manage seven programs at Yahoo um, within the Consumer and Home Ecosystem Engineering Org, <laughs> uh, which is the acronym CHE. So it's basically, um, I work in the organization of Yahoo that's focused on delivering consumer facing products. And with that being said, I manage seven programs. Um, I work with, and including those programs, there's several teams involved in the programs. And so I juggle and manage numerous projects at any given time. So um, as you can imagine, that's a huge, huge task, um, but it's something that I enjoy a great deal. Um, now, within the programs that I manage, I manage things. Uh, one of the programs, for example, that I manage is personalization, right? Um, we love to, as users, have um, our content personalized for our usage. For example, what types of articles you want to click on, what types of videos you want to watch. Um, that's one of the programs that I manage. Um, notifications, we all get the notifications that pop, on our, uh, pop up on our screens. Uh, that's another program. And then there are uh, several web and app uh, programs that I manage as well within uh, the Yahoo suite of products. Team roles is something that I, I want to discuss briefly. So today's topic is careers related to programming. Um, we know that coding you know, software development, that's very important uh, in producing web and, and mobile app products, right? But within the realm of monitoring programs at Yahoo, there are other roles um, that are essential, you know, to have when producing these products. Uh, first, the product manager. Uh, product managers are the people that actually um, think of new and innovative, you know, new enhancements, new products, new features to release, and they create a set of requirements based upon um, their thoughts on, on the, the different features. The designer, that's another role that's very important. They take the requirements from the product managers and they basically um, conceptualizes it. They, they basically take those requirements and think of um, user interface layout, right? Like where should buttons be located? Where should form fields be? What color schemes uh, to use? And then you have the developer, right? The developer looks at the information given to he or she by the designer and they decide, number one, what's the LOE, as we say, the level of effort. Um, how long would it take to code those features and really 
and, the, and this is the essential part, is to kind of bring uh, the products to life per se um, within the realm of um, the work as a, as a developer. Next, you have uh, QA engineers. And this is something that um, you all may not know too much about. QA stands for quality assurance. Um, we don't like the same developer that's coding the products. We don't want them to actually test them, right? Because we want to, to maintain that independence. So someone else called a QA, meaning quality assurance engineer, will actually test the code to make sure um, that it, it, it doesn't have any major defects or bugs. And uh, at times, this is also the stage in which accessibility checks will be performed as well. And then once it passes uh, those steps and all of these people, right, have done their work, that is when, you know, products are ready for release, right? So on this day that we're discussing careers related to coding, um, it's always important to note that, yeah, the developer is a key role, but there are other roles that are related that are just as important in launching new, fun, exciting, and innovative products. Um, like me, right? The technical program manager, I'm like the glue that holds all of these people together. I make sure that the product managers deliver the requirements on time per, spe per specifications. Um, I work out with the designers when they need to hand over um, their mocks and, and layouts to the developers. Um, and then I make sure that, you know, the QA engineers give the, give the green light, give the, the go ahead uh, for to have the product launches. So it's, so the TPM is like the glue that holds all of these um, roles together. And it also, one of the other things that I do with, within my role as a technical program manager, I help to clear out any blockers, any issues, any difficulties uh, that, that may arise during the process. So in closing, there are several careers, right? There are numerous careers related to coding um, and, and they all have an essential role in producing great products. Um, and it's also important to note that, you know, even someone that's blind or visually impaired can do these roles. Um, I am blind myself. I use a screen reader and I, throughout the course of my career, I've done all of the roles that I've named with the ex exception of product manager, which um, is actually pretty ironic because that's actually the least technical of them all. So, um, it is, it's something, it's very important to know that these are careers that are open to you. Um, if, if you're willing to invest the time, you're, you master your assistive technology um, and you want to do something that's, that's fulfilling in life and gives you a lot of uh, gratification. So set your goals high, right? Don't aim for mediocrity, set your goals high. And in the end, you will break barriers yourself and hopefully there will be others that will follow in your footsteps behind you. Thank you. Thank you, Kasaya. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna double check and see. It looked like we had a question come into the, uh, oh, I think the question specifically is which screen reader have you mostly used for your job? And, I think people are always curious about the specifics of how, maybe also how do you use a screen reader with your gem? Okay, this is a good one. I get this oftentimes. Um, I, for, for most of the work that I do, I use JAWS for Windows, okay? Um, when I lost my vision 20 years ago, JAWS, you know, is, a, is, is the, um, the screen reader that most, you know, blind screen readers use, um, especially within the business world. So after I started, um, you know, after I became blind, that's what I honed on. But now that I do work for a Silicon Valley tech company, a lot of those companies are on MacBooks. I do use the MacBook as well, but uh, voiceover on MacBook is not the same um, as JAWS on, for Windows, um, but I do use both. But individually, in my personal life, I prefer JAWS, and sometimes I'll use JAWS for work as well. 
but definitely um, because I work for a Silicon Valley tech company, um, I do use voiceover on the MacBook, especially when it comes to um, getting onto behind the, the, uh, the company firewall. Do you advise students try to pick up the dual systems while still in school, or do you think that's something to pick up on, on the spot? Well, I, if you learn, I would say this, if you, if you focus, I, I tell kids to focus on JAWS first. First of all, Windows machines are a lot cheaper. Okay, so you can not only use JAWS, but, you, but Windows machines come with narrator as well, which is also a good screen reader to start on. Um, it, you know, so, but JAWS was the one that I first started and that's the one that's been around for the longest and I've seen that as being the best. But, and, and it also opens up a lot more job opportunities for you because Windows machines are still kind of the, the number one, you know, business machine that is used in order to get gainful employment in this country. Absolutely. Oh, there's more questions coming My in. My degree, uh, yeah. So I have an electrical engineering degree. I've done a lot in the course of my career. I have an electrical degree, engineering degree and an MBA. But with respect to coding, um, you know, with an engineering degree, you can pretty much do everything. I mean, I've, I've done biomedical engineering work, systems analyst, QA, um, engineer, become an engineer. What that tells recruiters is that you know how to solve problems. Right. So they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, but later on, I got an MBA so I can do the type of work that I, I do right now. And that's um, managing the work of, um, of other teams. Fantastic. Um, so much learning on the job in every career choice that we take, right? We get as much prep work as we possibly can through our education in college, but we're always in for new content and new learning constantly through the rest of our lives. Um, Kasaya, double check. Oh, we, well, we have time for one more, one more question. The question's a long one. It comes in with, how would you help professionals to overcome the QA work being moved away from manual process to an automated, to automated testing using tools that are not accessible? Process okay. is a very professional. All right. So th this is a good question. I faced this very early in my career when I did do QA work. Um, but I overcame this. And, and number one, I, when I did the QA work, it was a time when there was no such thing as an accessibility field. I had to be my own IT expert, my own accessibility expert. And what I did was I honed in and mastered my assistive technology. And I, and I did, you know, I figured out workarounds. I also, you know, would study how to create JAW scripts and I would do them myself to, to better support those internal tools. However, this, we're in 2022 now. If there's something that is not accessible with your assistive technology, you need to let your manager and your HR people know because they have to accommodate you. Like you all should not have to do what I did 20 years ago. Like we're beyond that. Um, enterprise tools have to be accessible to your screen readers. And so, yeah, if you cannot manipulate it with your own assistive technology, please, go to your manager, go to your HR representatives and let them know that. Kasaya, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that comment. I know it's still not easy by any stretch of the imagination for new people going into the field. I know that there's still still struggles and difficulties with accessibility, with access, with, with, um, with all of the new tech and expectations of tech, but you, you're one of those that paved, those, paved the way. Um, and we now have technology companies seeking blind and low vision employees. Uh, and that's thanks in large part to the, to the forerunners like yourself who, who went before and truly appreciate your, your role in our field and education and your ability to join us in the National Coding Symposium and share your experience and motivate kids um, everywhere. Um, Thank you so very much. You're welcome. Um, we are moving on to a panel coming up. It's a panel and question and answering um, on coding. It's not just for geeks. Um, our panel, uh, our, our, our panel moderator, who will be introducing the group we saw earlier this week, um, Greg Stilson. I don't want to take away the thunder of uh, he does work at APH, and I would go through a variety of his past experiences, like I did with our. 
for our last keynote, but I do know that Greg worked in the historic Madison, Wisconsin grocery store um, of Cops Food Center. Um, it turns out that Cops Food Center in a quick Google search went out of business. Um, I would hope that, uh, well, I guess it's probably likely that APH did not do a deep dive into Greg Stilson's resume to discover <laughs> that Cops Food Center went out of business. Um, <laughs> But Greg started his career as a uh, as, as a what, Greg? A bagger? As a as a check checkout right, food? Man. Absolutely, a... I was a bagger. There you have it. I was. I started out as a bagger and worked my way up. I actually did some cashiering and then eventually ran the front end of the grocery store, doing all the scheduling. It was my college job, man. I loved it. It was great. It was. I got. I worked with like some of my best friends from high school and college at that job. And it was so fun because we, we just goofed off the whole day. It was so great. <laughs> <laughs> as, as stated, Cops yep. Food Center no longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we, we hopefully had nothing to do with that, but I don't know. <laughs> Well, time, times changed. You went through uh, a stint at Humanware, a long one, did some pretty incredible things, brought the Braille Note Touch Plus to market, which I know a lot of our attendees are excited about. You did a little time at IRA, and you are now at APH with a fancy title of the Head of Global Innovation, I believe. Um, right. Thank you, Greg, for joining us. I'm going to let you introduce our panel, who is all here. And um, if you're on our panel, make sure you turn your video on so that we can highlight you onto the screen. Awesome. Thanks, Adrian. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, what a great week we've had. Um, this has been so much fun to, uh, to talk with all of you and to, to see just some of the presentations and lessons that have been, been going on this week. I hope you all have, have gotten a, a significant amount of information, um, maybe even made some, some good contacts this week. Um, I think that overall, like the, the, and I, I, one of the questions that I'll be asking our panelists today is, you know, the the connections that you make um, at your early stages in your career uh, are, are those that that will help open doors for you down the road, right? There, there, there's I, I'm sure all of our panelists that that I'll introduce here today can can think of several people that has impacted their career um, and and has opened some doors for them to to get to where they are as well. So, I want to to introduce our our awesome panel. Um, uh, with me today, I've got uh, John Gardner from ViewPlus, Peter Tusick from Humanware, and Steve Clower from Desmos. Um, I've had the, the privilege of working with, with all three of these folks in some level of, of my career uh, throughout the years, and they are all fantastic at what they do. Um, if I can ask each of you to just do a quick couple minute summary of, of who you are and what you do uh, in your current role, uh, we'll start with John. If okay. John, if you John do me a favor. Will you tilt your camera upward? upward we know yes. you have a chin. Thank you. That right. helps us light dependent folk. John has a chin. <laughs> it doesn't even have a beard on it. <laughs> Go ahead, John. First of all, I want to I want to you to eat your heart out about my background. It's called R E A L, and it's even animated occasionally with something called W I F E walking past. So, <clears throat> um, anyway, um, so Greg started his career uh, bagging groceries. That was actually sort of second in my career. I bagged groceries too, but my first career was um, cleaning out chicken houses. So. Um, Anyway, that did prepare me for uh, going to graduate school and getting a PhD in physics. I was a physics professor for oh, a couple of hundred years, and I retired um, after I lost my sight uh, in mid-career physics in 1988, and uh, had a fairly substantial physics research group that suddenly I had a little trouble with because our data analysis was very, very careful graphical analysis. <clears throat> and blind people at the time didn't have any access to graphics. So that became a priority. I started a research group to uh, work on access to many things, but graphics was certainly one of them. We developed a technology. We won. Uh, prize for the student who actually developed it. 
got a patent, Oregon State got a patent, and I went out to the companies that made uh, braille embossers at the time, and I said, hey, we've got this cool new high-resolution technology for making tactile graphics. How would you like to license it? And they said, ah, <clears throat> blind people don't know what to do with tactile graphics, which is true because they never saw it before, so they didn't know what to do with it. And they don't need tactile graphics. <clears throat> I didn't agree with that. So we started a company called U+. Plus. U+ Plus has prospered and is now uh, generally considered the leading company in the manufacture of tactile graphics embossers. We also make a lot of software. And I've even gotten into doing some coding of necessity. So that's sort of my background. Awesome. Thank you, John. Uh, Steve, what do you do? Well, before he goes on to what he does, we're going to help our light dependent folk and we're going to know that he exists. Steve, you are really far from your camera and it's quite low. Oh, much better. We actually know you're there now. You blend mm -hmm. into your background for us. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Uh, blind guy operating a camera. Um, always, always <laughs> That's why I'm here. I yeah. appreciate that. And <laughs> I'll actually uh, remember where this thing is at uh, for future video calls. So thank you. Uh, free video advice. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My uh, name is Steve Clower here. I work at Desmos. Uh, we create uh, math software like uh, graphing calculators, uh, scientific calculators and such that run in the browser. Um, as well as uh, interactive classroom activities uh, that you might be using in school. Uh, our technology uh, is very accessible, um, largely because I asked them to let me make it accessible and they said that I could. Um, and you'll find it in all kinds of places. Uh, you might even find it on the Braille Note Touch Plus that uh, Greg, actually I think Greg, I emailed you uh, to make that happen originally with, uh, with HumanWare. Um, as well as the uh, the Polaris devices from Hims, and also some magnifiers from HumanWare. Um, so we're kind of all over. Uh, so if you need an accessible calculator um, that you don't have to pay for, that you can just run on your device of choice, whether it be Windows, Mac, or iOS, whatever, um, go check us out, desmos.com, uh, D-E-S-M-O-S.com. Um, I started, uh, actually my first paid job was doing audio for a, uh, a blindness uh, related game uh, from a long time ago that no longer exists. <laughs> uh, did that in college, uh, made a talking clock um, program that's still, uh, you can download called Steve's Talking Clock. Um, made some money off that. Uh, did some internship work, uh, making the Health and Human Services website accessible for uh, their office on disability back in the mid 2000s. Uh, Worked a few years at a GW Micro slash AI Squared. Some of you may remember them. Um, they made the windowized screen reader. Um, I wrote the GW Connect Skype application. That's still one of my uh, finest bits of work, I think. Um, and now I'm at Desmos. And I, I would say GW Connect and windowized are right behind uh, the work I do now because I get to make uh, math education more accessible to blind students uh, because it was not that great for me. So hopefully everyone has a better, <laughs> better time of it these days. So uh, thanks for having me on. Steve, and just to be clear, did you bag groceries? Uh, I did not. All right. Okay. Yeah, I'm, 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 to... I'm, I'm, I'm a loser. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Minor uh, deficiency, we forgive. <laughs> and uh, and just to be clear, I. Uh, um... Uh, John mentioned he programs out of necessity. Are you uh, a programmer in your your day to day work? I am, yes. Okay, gotcha. Awesome. And last but not least, Peter Peter Tusick, what do you do? Thanks so much, Greg. Uh, my name is Peter Tusick, and I am the director of strategic partnerships here at Humanware. Um, I have had the fortunate opportunity of working with Greg um, when I first started at Humanware uh, from 2015 until 2018. So we worked together and I learned so much and I'm really glad to be here. As far as what I do, um, I'm currently responsible for, we, we have a lot of strategic partners throughout the world. So this could be places and organizations such as APH um, or the, the RNIB in the UK um, or the National Federation of the Blind here in the United States. And I kind of serve as a liaison um, and work with our strategic partners to make sure that everything is running smoothly. And I also work on a daily basis with our product management team 
on making sure our blindness products are running smoothly, um, giving lots of feedback and kind of serving as a conduit between the end user and the product management side. And then I manage a team of product specialists. So we do a lot of hands-on workshops. Um, we believe in that real kind of boots on the ground type of support here at Humanware. So you may have attended a workshop or webinars or things that we have put on or our team of fantastic product specialists. So I'm also kind of the that front facing side as well. So it's a multifaceted or kind of a tripartite sort of role here at Humanware. Um, definitely had a lot of stops along the way. I never did bag groceries, but I was I was telling uh, Greg earlier that I did work for a graphic design company as a totally blind person. Um, and I was collating and putting labels on all sorts of documents and things for this company uh, for the summer one year. So have had some interesting stops um, and have done various things in the school system as well as uh, some other previous places. But it's interesting to hear where we've all started. I have never cleaned a chicken coop and I've never programmed a, an application. So I'm not in that uh, sort of realm. I, I don't have those cool experiences, but I definitely come with uh, putting labels on, on paper. So that was kind of started me uh, down the road of where I am today. But it's really neat to be here and to hear kind of everyone's experience and sort of what we do today versus what we did in yesteryear or, or you know, along the way to get to where we've gotten. Well, Peter, not being a coder is, is understandable, but not having ever having cleaned out a chicken coop, that's a deficiency. I'm coming to Oregon uh, probably in a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll practice. Oh, all right. All right. Game on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll track you down, that. John. <laughs> uh, all right. So I think what we'll do is start off with some, some, some questions here. Um, first question, and actually I'll, I'll, I'll pose it to the, the, I'll start with you, Peter, just because you mentioned that you're not an active coder uh, in your role. So even if, this, if a student doesn't have an intention of ever being a coder or anything like that, is there a benefit for them learning, learning um, coding or computational thinking uh, early on in their life? So, so the key there, and you, you said computational thinking, and I think so much of what we do when I talk to parents and just being a totally blind person, and I'm very fortunate to have a family and do all these different things and own my own home and whatnot, you know, so much of what we do on a daily basis is related to problem solving. And what, what coding or, or computational thinking and sort of going down those roads, going down those avenues, when we're young, helps to develop and teach problem solving skills. And it is so important for us to, to kind of have those skills to promote or to kind of become independent. And independence can look different for each and every one of us. We'll all have different goals that we strive for, but one of the common threads that I find builds independence, and independence can mean asking for help, right? It's a big piece of independence, but that is also part of problem solving. Um, we need to be able to problem solve. So when, we, when we're thinking kind of and analyzing and thinking in, in that manner, um, we're going to build those skills, which are going to lead us to be very independent or get us to at least think about other ways of accomplishing a task. So I think it's extremely important um, in terms of developing problem solving skills. It's kind of the, the angle I would take uh, for that sort of answer, but I'm sure there are other thoughts. Uh, John, anything to add to that or? echo it? Well, um, uh, I'm, I find it hard to imagine getting through life without ever writing any code. So I'm sort of amazed that Peter has managed to do it because I just keep running up with little things I need for myself. Um, I like to play bridge. Well, playing bridge as a blind person is not easy. Um, so I wrote a Python program, as it turns out, and uh, use a little scanner, and I can scan the cards in, and I can play bridge, not quite as fast as sighted people, but close. Um, that's just one of many things. Um, but critical thinking, I think, is something that every human being really needs to be able to do. Coding is not the only way you can learn to critically think, but it's certainly a good way. It's a practical way. And for blind people, um, doing coding is a, probably the easiest route to a good job than I know. You know, more blind computer scientists, computer programmers, 
I think, in almost any other category, and many of them are extremely well paid. Thank you very much. So, yes, I think it's a good thing to do. Is it the best thing to do? No, I don't know. And Steve, anything else to add? Yeah, I cannot emphasize enough um, the benefit of gaining critical thinking skills uh, with coding, whether you decide to pursue that as a profession or not. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not for everybody, um, and I'm certainly not going to be one of the people that tries to push that on people that, uh, you know, maybe that's just not 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 what they want to do. But as a blind person, especially, you need to be adaptable, um, and part of that capability revolves around being able to solve problems sometimes coming up not just with all right how do i figure out what's wrong but also how can i make this work um, whether it's something as simple as all right i'm trying to print something uh you know for for work and the printer's not working okay why isn't it working is it that the cable's broken is it not plugged into the wall yes i've done that before um you know for, from simple things like that to this application that I need for work isn't, you know, is, is acting strangely. And, you know, if it's a web application, all right, I can bring up the console and actually write some live code to see what's going on. Again, is that something that everyone needs to do? No. But at least having some familiarity with coding or at least the, the concepts that, uh, you know, make us a, a bit more relatable, relatable rather to how computers work is of immense benefit, uh, especially as uh, our society goes, you know, more technological uh, seemingly each day. Absolutely. And, I, you know, I want to, I want to kind of clarify something you said there, you know, we, we're, we're talking about coding, right? And, and on a daily basis, I am not writing code. I have written code. I can write code but I, I don't do it on a daily basis. But what you're talking about, and what I think John mentioned as well, is, is critical thinking, right? And this ability to troubleshoot problems um, and come up with the root cause of the problem. Those are all, whether you're writing code or not, that is still, you know, those are core fundamental things that maybe you're not gonna be coding, but you're going to be needing to solve problems in whatever job that you're, you're trying to get to. So I, I love what you said, John, that, you know, these, these critical thinking um, skills that you create give you a path to, in, to, this, to this level of employment. And, and that's, that's crucial. I, I said in my talk earlier, I, and I agree with you, John, that I think this is probably the best time to be a blind person in technology ever. Um, you, <laughs> can, you can get paid very well for, for having those skills. So mm -hmm. I love what you said. Well, um, Greg, I, I think yeah, just to kind of second what, what you're saying and, and you know, we, we learn at a very young age in school, in second grade, third grade, we learn about cause and effect. You know, we, we do, we learn, and that in, in its most basic form, I mean, that is getting you ready for coding or kind of getting you in that, teaching you those concepts. I took a class in college on symbolic logic, and I was, just, you know, on truth tables and if-then statements and all these things where you break down the English language into, into symbols. And it really teaches you how to how to form that critical thinking and kind of think about if I do this, what happens or what else could happen or and, you know, what can happen in addition. So it's uh, it's interesting how we're actually surrounded by whether we code actively or not. We're kind of surrounded by decision making and, and all of that critical thinking becomes a part of that. Well, I think that, you know, when when you look at all that we've heard this week, right, we've heard from coders, we've heard from non coders that work in the tech industry, right? Peter and I are not daily coders. We both work in the tech industry. Um, we both have have learned the basics of coding. We both have learned all that, but you know we're we're not actual active coders. But there's there's plenty of great jobs. We just um, heard, we've heard from several this week that you know are driven by knowing this knowledge, right? So you don't have to just be a coder or be a just be a non-coder you can be somebody who kind of does both as well there's so many opportunities out there and, and having those fundamental uh, thinking or you know, that foundational thinking is um, is crucial uh, I'm gonna go to Steve and just mention or ask the question and it's kind of a two-part question so you're talking to two different people now you're talking to a student 
who's hesitant to learn coding, and you're talking to a teacher, a teacher of the visually impaired, who has never learned coding, knows nothing about coding, and is really hesitant to teach it. What would you say to each of those folks to, to try to kind of pump them up a little bit, to try to give them in, inspiration to, to keep the course and try to learn, learn some coding concepts? Oh, good question. Tough question. Um, one of those answers, and I'm not saying that just because I'm talking uh, on an APH panel, but seriously to call APH, um, because I've I've seen Code Jumper, and uh, I, I forget the name of the new, newest line of products that uh, you guys are working on, but I, I saw this fairly recently. Um, you're breaking down a lot of the traditional barriers that have existed for you know getting. Uh, blind people interested in in coding at at very young ages. Um, what I would tell the student is sort of a, a repeat of what's been said here that uh, you know these skills could be very valuable not just to help you in your daily life as far as solving problems, but it could lead you down a career that yes will pay well. And if you have a disability, that's not easy to do. Uh, it's not easy to find find good work. Um, and from a strictly practical standpoint, if you need a computer to do something and if you know how to make it do it, you don't have to wait for someone else. You can do it yourself. I've, I've got all sorts of little programs I run on devices like Raspberry Pis or, you know, my Windows desktop. Some of it runs automatically. Some of it I invoke manually just to do all sorts of things that I need. Is the code production quality? Probably not, but it does what I want. And I didn't have to pay anyone to do it. So there's there's that advantage just to being able to make your own stuff, um, which is pretty fun. Um, for the, the teacher of the visually impaired, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of hesitancy that I, I can certainly uh, empathize with, um, especially if the teacher may not have, you know, a, a, a huge technical background. But what I will say is there's there's been a long myth that coding programming is hard. And it can be, depending on what you're trying to do. But it also doesn't have to be. And a lot of times you don't need, you know, a rocket science degree to write a program on a computer to make it do something. Um, there's a lot of tools out now that make learning the fundamentals very, uh, well, I don't want to say very easy, but there's it's not as hard as it used to be. You're not sitting in front of a, a terminal window writing loops, you know, that write a hundred bottles of beer on the wall or, or whatever, you know, you're actually doing things, you know, making a game or something like that, that gives you a more realistic goal of, you know, here's something I want to make that I would actually enjoy using after it's been made and not just some, bland boring exercise that you know someone's gonna throw at me on a on an exam um but yeah the 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 tools are there they're getting better and the barrier to entry is getting lower and lower which is is great so i would say don't be discouraged see what's there and who knows the student might actually like learning it the teacher might enjoy teaching it but you never know if you don't try John, anything to add? Um, when I first saw this question you sent out, I didn't know the answer to it. And um, I really still don't. Um, if you're talking about a juxtaposition of a student who's not anxious to learn coding and a TVI who's not anxious to teach it, honestly, I don't even, I have no idea what to say to them. But if either one of them is interested, I think I could, give them some advice and it's a little bit repetitive of what Steve just said. Um, a student a student who is hesitant, I would give them pretty much the same advice that Peter had that it's, I mean, first of all, coding is fun or it can be fun. It's, it is really a lot of fun to have a challenge and code something that works and, and actually does what you want it to do. It's a really, really good feeling. Um, and if you have a student who wants to learn coding and a teacher who doesn't know how to teach it, my best advice is don't try to teach it. If you don't know anything about it, don't try to teach the student. Do 
find out resources for the student and point and add it. I mean, coding is something that that somebody who wants to do it can learn how to do. There are just tons of resources out there. There are lots of tutorial programs for virtually any any program that you would like, and as long as the program itself is accessible, and a lot of them are. Um, and I think helping this person along and maybe finding other resources, APH would be a really good example. I think uh, just, just being able to enable a student to learn is a lot more important than trying to actually teach them if you don't have the skills to do it. Because, I mean, TVIs are busy as hell. They don't have time to learn all this stuff just to teach one student unless they're really very interested in learning it themselves. So I wouldn't want to put that burden on them. But finding resources, that's something else good. Peter? Well, I will kind of third uh, what, what has been said here, but I think from the from the student standpoint, you know, if if you're afraid of coding, if it seems very intimidating, because it, it certainly can be, as, as John has said and, and as Steve has said, I think a lot of times it's about thinking about what do you do on a daily basis that's essentially a coding activity, right? I was at a presentation earlier this week in Michigan, and Anne McKay-Bacon, who may be here for all I know, asked all the participants, and there was a lot of students in the room, how many of you have taken a shower in the last couple of days? How many <laughs> of you have been on a bus or a, in a car that stopped at a traffic light? Um, how many of you have, and, and kind of going through just things that when, when you're, you know, in, encountering these activities, you're actually participating in, in some sense and kind of problem solving or in pieces that are coding based activities. So without realizing it, you're making decisions, you are thinking, you're, you're analyzing, you're doing the things that you'll be doing once you start to code. And the other piece is it can be very fun in terms of it being tangible, something you can touch. So when you learn those coding concepts, it's not memorizing a whole bunch of things, it's grabbing a code jumper and plugging things in and hearing the songs that's, that are made and learning that block code concept. And it's actually not that difficult. And then you start to have fun with it because you're building a story or you're you're making right something happen and you're changing it and doing fun things and saying, what happens if I do this or that? And most most of the time that will break down that barrier um, and kind of making things scary if you're in second or third or fourth grade and want to get into coding or even younger. From the teacher side, it's absolutely what has been said. There are some phenomenal curriculum. I know Adrian or, or I believe Adrian could have been because I mentioned uh, Quorum. You know, there are dedicated ways of learning block coding or Python or other types of code. There are so many resources out there, whether it's CodeQuest or CodeJumper. Um, I know at HumanWare, we are working on a key code program that I'll be talking about briefly, very briefly, um, later on this afternoon for somebody who's going to code in Braille. And some of those things, you know, we're, we're working on providing resources and adding to the resources that already exist. I've seen some very, very great comprehensive tutorials and resources on the APH website related to CodeJumper and other activities. So, there are a ton of resources. And I would say just like any teacher goes to AER or any teacher is on these Facebook groups, um, any teacher is, is kind of talking with their peers, talk to other TVIs who've done this, even if it's something you've never done. I know so many teachers, for instance, who create braille music for their students who've never done it before and they learn as they go and they think, wow, this is, this is really neat, you know, and this is something that they now know how to do. It's now in their skill set. Same with creating or, or producing um, coding or, or other materials. It's something you kind of work with and get into. And it, it seems scary, but like riding a bike or like doing anything we're unfamiliar with, once you start getting into it, you can uh, start to feel that sense of accomplishment. As John said, it feels good um, to kind of get to that end result. And so you will start to enjoy it and kind of see those, those quick wins as successes and you'll build on that. So I think, uh, you know, just to kind of recap what everybody said, I, I would certainly agree with all those points. I, I heard a, a common thread there and the, the, the best way to motivate a kid to want to learn coding or to want to learn a new skill of, of any type is do something you're passionate about, right? I, the number of talks that we've had this week that has always, it seems there's a common theme that I sensed, which was uh, I wanted to, to make a game. 
right? Like the, I, I want to say there's at least four of them this week that said that they learned to code because they wanted to, to create a specific game, right? Well, that's, that's a passion. That's something that people wanted to do. And if you're, you know, passionate about it, then you're going to take the time to learn how to actually, you know, make it and, and build it and create those skills and things. I think the, the, the thing I heard about the teachers is that you, you don't need to be an expert. In fact, it, it probably is better that you're not um, in some cases because you, then you're equipping your student to, with the tools to serve themselves, right? So you're, you're giving them the resources, but then you're also giving them the added skills of problem solving themselves, right? How, you know, I always, I always like the teachers that, that ask me and that they're writing down every single word that I'm saying in a workshop and that's no, that's not necessary anymore. There's resources out there, and I think that we have the opportunity to empower our students with those skills of of researching their own uh, solutions to problems. The internet's a wonderful place, and I can tell you that even accomplished coders today uh, are on Stack Overflow and are on. There's, there's. If if you run into a problem that you can't solve, somebody out there most likely has solved it in some way, shape, or form. And there's so much, re so many resources out there. So giving your student the, the ability to be creative and researching their own solutions, I think is one of the, the best things that a teacher can do. Um, you know, uh, Steve mentioned today that, you know, technology is evolving so fast, right? Today, um, tech, it seems like there's a new device or a new solution or a new something that's come out every single day almost. Uh, Steve, how do you keep up with the trends um, in tech uh, and, and in, in your field in coding? Um, maybe it's a new, a new language. Maybe it's a new way of doing things. How do you keep up with the trends? Uh, yeah, there's, there's a few ways. Um, some of it is just from, you know, I might hear something from someone else on my team. Um, they may be plugged into resources that I typically don't look at. Um, but a lot of things I actually get through, uh, you know, either following organizations, uh, you know, like uh, APH or Microsoft, uh, Hacker News, GitHub, you know, all, all kinds of, you know, related sort of uh, technical resources on various platforms like Twitter. Or, you know, I might occasionally get something in email. Um, but I'd say a lot of the information I get actually comes through, you know, reposted articles and, and such, uh, from, from social media or, uh, you know, fellow coworkers or just people that I know that discover something cool and, you know, somehow I wind up finding out about it and then I'll pass it on to whoever else is interested. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of that. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's how I keep up. But you, John. Um, I, uh, I, uh, sorry, I've been distracted by looking at the uh, questions coming in, which I'm trying to avoid. Um, so how are, uh, how are you, you keeping how do you keep up with the the tech technology trends the the maybe the new ways of doing oh, sorry. coding Thanks. how do you keep up with that kind of stuff well to be quite truthful i don't um i'm i, I i'm a hacker you know, i've i've done coding um, my god i think my first uh, introduction to computers was when i was a a student intern in college learning something called Fortran, just Fortran, not Fortran one or two or anything else. Uh, when um, I, I got a lab computer, I used, uh, well, I used Fortran. I, you know, I guess I didn't use Fortran for that. You see, I did a lot of machine language programming in the early stages of my lab computer, uh, used basic, used other things. And I never really got good at any of them. I just got good enough to make it do what I wanted it to do. And I still uh, do that. I, uh, I mostly nowadays uh, do JavaScript programming on web app sort of things. And uh, anybody who looks at my code sort of 
goes guffaw, laugh, choke. Uh, but it's it works. It works for me. And and mostly I'm coding not to make a final product, but to make um, make a prototype that people who are better coders than I am can make make work faster and better and more robustly. So um, the, the the only effort that I put into finding what's modern is occasionally, and more than occasionally, I will run across something often on places like Stack Overflow, which is absolutely wonderful place, um, that shows me a, a new JavaScript technique that was introduced last year or the year before that I use. So I, I guess um, Stack Overflow is probably the closest thing to my access to keeping up. Absolutely. But, um, Peter, you're not a programmer, but there's a lot of news in the tech world. What do you do to keep up with it? Yeah, so I'm, I'm lucky. There's kind of two sides to this as to how I'm able to keep up with, with what's going on. And one is old-fashioned face-to-face sort of communication. Um, I am very fortunate to be able to travel quite a bit for the work I do, and definitely not over the last two years. But I was in Michigan this week. I was in Houston a couple of weeks ago. I I've kind of go into the classroom. So certainly to keep up with what's going on in education, it's generally in front of me um, in terms of being able to talk to what students and teachers are using, um, what their needs are, and I can pass that directly along to product management and whatnot. So I'm, I'm, I love asking questions and being able to be right in front of everybody. And then on the general side, in certain terms of just the main sort of technology, the flow of what's out there, what is new, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, there's a lot of great blindness podcasts out there in terms of blindness technology. And then things, you know, reading CNET um, or kind of keeping up with what Apple or, or Amazon or Microsoft um, or these companies are doing and sort of networking is the other way I really keep up. And networking is a, an extremely important part of any career, whether you're a TVI or whether you're working in a call center or anything, right? When we're, when we're finding work and employment and opportunities and growth, networking is a great way to do that. And networking is also how I keep up with what's going on because somebody will reach out and say, maybe I didn't hear it in the classroom. Maybe I didn't hear it on a podcast or, or you know, pay attention to a news story on what might be new, but a teacher might reach out that I've talked to in the past and say, hey, did you hear about this? And I'll say, no, I have never heard of this platform or no, I don't, I'm not aware. And then boom, it's on my radar because of the relationships I've developed. So it really, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a few pieces as to how I can stay stay current, but they're all sort of useful in their own way to make sure that I'm trying to know as much as out there. And the reality is I will never be able to fully know every single thing that is going on as hard as I try, as hard as we all try. We might be very into a certain strand or a certain topic, and we're very current with that, but certainly there is a lot that gets by me that I'm not aware of, and I'm always happy to learn. So I, I think that's the other piece is I'm always trying to keep my ear to the ground um, to listen um, and, and learn what's going on as well, because there's a lot that, that I can't keep up with, even with those sort of channels I just mentioned. I think everybody kind of has their own, their own techniques. I'm going to pivot to a question that just came up in the chat, because I think it's a good one um, that I think a lot of our audience members may have. So it says, what advice would you give to someone like me who didn't major in computer science in college but is looking to get into the coding field now? Uh, John, would you like to start with that one? Oh, sure. Um, I can tell you what I did. Um, I remember um, I spent quite a few years coding in BASIC. And um, I was using a DOS-based or, or um, um, command line-based um, interpreter to do this. And this was mostly for my own use. But there came a time when these um, applications, the interpreters, the uh, compilers, the et cetera, et cetera, no longer worked and weren't being replaced by anything new. And I realized that I had to do something more modern. And I decided at the time that the little bit of investigation told me that what I should learn is Python. And so I started reading tutorials on Python and I just learned, learned how to do it. Um, 
there are better ways to do it. If you are a student and you're in a university, there are all sorts of facilities, not just classes either. There are often student organizations that are devoted to uh, doing things like learning how to code or doing robotics. And you can join those and learn from your peers. Um, so the resources that are available to you depend on where you are. But even if you're at a place that there are none, you can just get on the internet and um, and start reading and doing little short tutorials. A lot of these things are sort of quasi accessible to blind people. Um, that, so that some of the examples are really not accessible, but um, if you if you sort of plod your way through a lot, of, a lot of them are pretty accessible, but um, but there are and there's advice you can ask on various blind list serves of what what would be a good place to start learning X Y Z. Um, it's it's doable, and it's it's actually kind of fun and challenging. So uh, just do it. <laughs> find, find whatever resources are available to you, take advantage of them. But if there are none, just start working on your own. You heard it here. Just do it. I like yep. that, John. Yep. I like that a lot. What about you, Steve? What advice would you have for somebody who didn't major in computer science but is interested in getting into coding? So uh, my advice to, uh, to them uh, collectively would be it's never too late to start. Um, one thing that I've grown to appreciate, especially after having gotten out of you know education being something that I have to do, is there's always more to learn. And I feel kind of cheated if I go a day and I don't learn something. Um, so just because you don't have a degree doesn't mean you can't start. Um, as far as where to start, um, this advice may be outdated because, <laughs> you know, again, technology is changing so fast. But these days, I would say it's probably best to begin with, um, you know, something that will run on the web. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One, most of the tools, maybe all of the tools that you would need, you can get for free. You don't have to pay for any of it. Uh, the second is that you can run them on just about any kind of modern device, whether you've got a Windows machine or, or a Mac, or you know if you live in uh, Unix or Linux land, uh, things will work there. Um, the end results also could be, um, oftentimes are, cross-platform, so you can run your newfangled thing on your Windows machine. You could run it on your iPhone if you wanted to. Um, that's That kind of flexibility we haven't had in a, well, I don't want to say ever, but that's a pretty recent development um, where you can write something and have it run uh, just about anywhere. Um, and the web will oftentimes let you do that. And there are even places that you can go online, pull up a website that lets you write code in one part of the page and see what happens in another part. So you don't even have to install any special software, just go to a website. I mean, I don't know how much simpler it can get. Um, so, and there, you know, like, like John was saying, there's a whole slew of resources available, um, depending on which way you want to go. Um, more and more resources being made available all the time. Uh, one place that I haven't heard much mention of, uh, is YouTube. Uh, YouTube has lots of stuff. Um, if you want to just start and, you know, some people have actually had full courses that they've put up on YouTube, um, that you can mostly follow, even if you can't see what they're writing, you can go to, uh, freecodecamp.org. Uh, that's another good place. Um, if you're not sure where to start, they've got all kinds of free resources for you. Um, so there you go. I love that. It's, it's fantastic. And it just goes along with the theme that, that you know, being today is is just a great day or a great time to become a, a coder who's blind and all these resources are either accessible or as john says quasi accessible um you know microsoft make code is another one um that is that is quite good um so you know it's this is uh it's a it's a great time to 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 be a coder who who is blind or at least to, to build that foundational skills 
Um, I wanted to take a minute to give you guys a chance to brag on yourself. Um, and this is the part that I, I always love to, to kind of showcase what, what you all have done. Um, so if you could select one project or one product that you have influenced or you personally built that you're most proud of, um, tell us about it. What's the, what's the thing that you uh, look back on your career and say, I did this and I am incredibly proud of it? Uh, I'll start with you, Peter. Well, I, I find this, the irony here is, uh, is just awesome because the, the product in the project I want to talk about is currently not online. Um, so that's always good, right? I'm so proud of it and it was so much fun and you can't even use it. Uh, but that doesn't mean it isn't coming back <clears throat> within a week or two. So we built uh, Humanware. One of our just consistent pieces for our teachers, for our users is I want to get support on a product, but it's really hard to find. Um, we have a, we really struggle with locating information, how to guides and videos and how do we quickly contact support or how do we, can we search by product? Can we do all these things without having to go on a website? And we built an app called HW Buddy, which is an iOS and Android application that will be relaunched in the next week or two. We had to do some big time, big time server migration and things um, on and a lot of back end work because lots of things got uh, muddled toward the end of last year. But the app allows you, um, any user or anyone who just wants to learn more about humanware, to come in and you, there's a how-to guides tab, tab where again, you can look at, break it down by product. So maybe you have a Mantis Q40, uh, maybe you have a, um, a, a brilliant Braille display or a Braille Touch Plus or a low vision device. And you want to look at those guides and share them with yourself right out of the app. So they're all broken down by task. We also have lesson plans that can be created. We have quick ways to watch our videos on our YouTube channel, whether that's based on product or, or webinars that we host. Quickly contact support in your region of the world. So again, it, it's a humanware in your pocket essentially, but it's a way for us to take all of our resources. Similar to the, the Hive, right? We're able to take all of our resources and throw them into one piece that's in everybody's pocket. Because we always hear that, I don't want to print out a user manual and I'm going from school to school, or I just want to find out how to you know, check the battery life of a, of a low vision device or something. Um, and the HW Buddy app will allow you to do that because you can search by product. And it was a lot of fun to build and test. Um, certainly needed constant refining as any app does as you learn. and. Um, kind of build. So that was a ton of fun. And unfortunately, it's been kind of not around for the last four months, but it will be back. And we are going to be shouting from the mountaintops once it is back um, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we, we just had a lot of fun building that. And I was super happy to take part in, in doing something like that uh, for the benefit of the community. Awesome. Uh, John, what about you? Um, I think that what I am most proud of um, was something dating from about 1999. Um, we had started ViewPlus, the company, a couple of three years earlier to, to um, mark, uh, develop and manufacture and market the new technology that we call Tiger, Tiger at the time, and we still do. Um, the new plus for a couple of three years was just a backyard garage sort of thing. And it was being run by two of my students who assured me that they knew how to run a company. Well, it became apparent by about 1999 that they were not being successful. And my wife and I made a decision, had to make a decision. Do we just forget the whole thing or do we take it over? and try to make it work. And we had no idea. I was an academic, she was an academic. She has no particular technical skills. As a blind guy trying to figure out a way to manufacture something, I had no idea. We had no idea how we we're gonna do it, but we decided we were gonna do it. And uh, with a hell of a lot of luck and help from my friends, we succeeded. And now we have a company that has meant a lot to a lot of blind people. And it's not the money that we've made from you. Plus, God knows, uh, I don't think I will ever get my money back totally out of the company, although it's doing quite well now, thank you. Um, it's, the, it's the people that I meet at meetings who come up and thank me for making it possible for them to study math in college or other sorts of things. 
So the fact that I had whatever it was, courage, stupidity, to push that button and say, we don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. And we went out and managed to hire a person or two and managed to convince friends and relatives to fund it and us to fund it enough to get it off the ground. That's That I think was the most important thing I've done in my life. That's pretty incredible. Um, and what about you, Steve? Oops, sorry about that. Uh, you know, that's kind of a tough thing to answer. Um, I was just choosing I'm, I'm, one. I know. <laughs> you know I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of everything that I've been fortunate enough to, to be a part of. Um, but I guess, honestly, the work I'm doing right now is, is what I'm most proud of. Um, making interactive math accessible to people with disabilities, um, has never really been done. Um, and, and until we started it at, at Desmos, um, of that work, I'd say probably the thing I'm most proud of is getting Braille, making it possible to actually read and get back Braille math output, um, on a modern device, um, that is independent of screen reader. So you can go into our, our software and if you want to work in Nemeth Braille, or UEB, you can put our software, whether it's the calculators or even in our um, our classroom lessons, you can put those into Braille mode. You get Braille in, or you know, you can Braille into the system, and it will send Braille back out to you. So even if you write, you know, two plus two, you'll see equals four, or square root of pi, you'll see whatever that number happens to be. Um, writing a Braille translator that runs in JavaScript on the web. Um, was a really fun mm -hmm. project and something that I've never done anything like <laughs> before. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of that work. Oh, you should be. It was, it was, I, I remember the first time I connected a Braille display and used, used the Desmos calculator uh, with the Braille display and it just worked uh, from there. And I think that that is, is incredible because uh, you're absolutely right. It wasn't something that had ever been really done in a web-based kind of interactive situation like that before. So kudos to you on that one. Well, I, uh, I see that we're running really short on time. I want to, I, I, I always, I send way more questions over to our panelists than I know that we're ever going to have time to get to, but I want to make sure that we had, <laughs> we had a, a, a full stock of options if we needed it. But um, we've had some great participation by the audience as well, posing some questions and things like that. Um, I'm going to finish with the most common uh, question that I think every single one of our panelists and presenters has been, <laughs> been asked. And it's always the question that I, uh, I receive. And I, I, I say that in, in this field uh, of, of serving people who are blind or visually impaired, um, we're never going to agree on the same screen reader and we're never going to agree on the same text-to-speech engine. But <laughs> the question that is the most popular in the chat is what screen reader do you all use on a daily basis? So we'll start with you, John. Well, <clears throat> I use NVDA and I use JAWS. Uh, I have learned to use Narrator. Um, Narrator uh, actually is a pretty good program now, but I, I use, I, I mostly use Windows. Uh, I, I use uh, VoiceOver, of course, on my iPhone, but I don't do any programming in VoiceOver. I guess, um, well, I've, I, I, NVDA and JAWS both have strengths, and I use whichever one happens to be the most appropriate for what I'm doing at the time. I switch back and forth a lot. That's great. You, Peter? Uh, I, I'll take the diplomatic uh, approach here as well, and, and I think John had the perfect answer. You use what's going to be best at the, at the time for the problem you're trying to solve. And so I'm a JAWS user natively. I mean, that's, that's my, my preferred screen reader just because that's what I grew up using. It does not mean that it's the only way or, or just because I use it, it's uh, perfect for everyone else. I certainly switch over to NVDA constantly. I also am a heavy voiceover user. I'm a talkback user. Um, I definitely know how to use voiceover on the Mac. And in addition, it's not just about the screen reader, but sometimes, you know, when, when you're using Chrome with NVDA, you need to switch to JAWS for something to work or vice versa, or maybe it's Chrome that's the issue. So maybe you need to use Mozilla or maybe you need to try some other solutions. So being open to a myriad of solutions. 
and not thinking that kind of it's a one size fits all approach, in my opinion, is going to help us all get to kind of where we want to be. As much as I wish there was this blanket solution where we could just use one screen reader or just use a PC or just use an iPhone or just use a note taker, it's not going to fly um, in today's today's world, in today's landscape. We need to problem solve. And I was buying something a couple of years ago and I had to use four different combinations of screen reader slash web browser until it finally worked. So my ability to, to kind of problem solve and, and do that helped me tremendously. So I am a JAWS user, but uh, certainly go with the flow and kind of do whatever's going to, to be most appropriate for the task at hand, exactly kind of how, how John wrapped up his comments. What about you, Steve? So uh, I, w I will say learn as many tools as you can because they all have their strengths and weaknesses. As for me personally, um, I, for, uh, you know, for, for work, you know, we're very heavy on the, on the Mac side and Mac and voiceover work well for some things. They do not work well in a lot of other things. Um, so I'm always running a, a windows virtual machine in those instances. Um, and on that, I use NVDA more than jaws at this point. It just works better with the tools that I use. Um, but yeah, like Peter just said, uh, I had to sign uh, some documents a few months ago and I tried everything that I could think of as far as combinations of browser and screen reader and device and platform. And ultimately the ending, the solution that allowed me to technically sign these things wound up being a combination of, uh, on the Windows side, NVDA and Firefox. So sometimes you, you just got to know how to do all that because you never know when uh, something's not going to work and you need to fall back to, uh, to something else. So this is John. Can I just say one Please? more thing? Mm -hmm. um, I'm working now uh, on developing some really nice uh, accessibility applications or web apps. And uh, we ran into a problem with JAWS. JAWS just wouldn't do what we needed to do. And I've been communicating with Glenn Gordon and Glenn, bless his heart, came up with a solution for us. And I, I need to, I just want to acknowledge that. I mean, this is well beyond the call of duty. It's just that um, he decided that he wanted JAWS to be able to work for us. And he's come up with a solution that's close to perfect. So um, when things don't work, there's always a, another way out. And I really, really I do appreciate it. I love what you're saying, John, because, you know, a lot of times and, and JAWS wouldn't be this this sort of example, but a lot of times accessibility is not at the forefront. And it's not that it's not wanted or, or you know, that it's not wanted to be part of products and things. But when you come across a situation where something is not accessible, reaching out to the developer, reaching out and letting people know and not just saying it doesn't work, but letting them know what you're trying to do, the steps you're taking and what you're expecting to happen can go a long way in helping a developer understand how to work with you or how to uh, address an inaccessible situation. So John is spot on. And, and in this case, you know, he's able to go to the, the product manager. Same thing with, with our devices, right? We hear something doesn't work or we hear there's a problem that needs to be solved. And we're, we're happy to do that. As I know John does with View Plus, right? They, they hear a problem and it's, wow, we need to address this or we need to find a way. And, and then people get busy behind the scenes. So reaching out and contacting and, and sharing information is extremely important um, when something isn't working, just as it's very important to, on the in the moment, problem solve with your several combinations of web browsers, screen readers, operating systems, uh, devices, and so on. So. Right. So what I heard from the screen reader summary is that you all have one that I would say is sort of your default. You've mastered this screen reader. Um, but but being able to pinch hit or switch out to other OSs or other screen readers um, is, is something you all do. And, and I, would, I would say I'm the same way. I'm a JAWS uh, slash NVDA user by default, but I, I work with all of them on a, maybe not a daily basis, but at least a weekly basis. So uh, Does that being, include Thunder, Greg? You know, it doesn't. It doesn't include Thunder, Peter. <laughs> Thunder. How about Supernova? I want to thank I want, I want to thank each and every one of you for your time for for uh, all of your knowledge and what you've done for the field. Um, each one of these folks is uh, a, a huge contributor to the entire field that that we're we're talking about here, and um, just want to thank them for their time that they've spent on Friday. 
Uh, everybody have a great rest of the the uh, the symposium and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you, Greg. You forgot work up, Peter. Um, thank you all. That was that was super inspirational. You guys are all so eloquent. Shout out to APH View Plus Desmos Humanware. You guys are leading our field and doing great things. Um, we have big challenges, is what I heard at the end of that that um, panel. We have big channels that are challenges that are well worth taking on and addressing, but we also are a small world and we, we need to appreciate that. Um, we can reach out directly to the people behind the scenes at the companies that make accessibility happen. Um, those companies and those developers will hear, will hear you as a student, as a user, as a TVI, um, and will impact and make those changes to make their products even better and even more accessible and workable for you. Um, we, we are on Zoom, so you're going to be responsible for your own stretch break during our next presentation. Uh, we realize we bypassed our natural little break. Uh, so stand up, please stretch your body. Uh, make sure that you are joining us from a, from a healthy space. Um, but I am excited to introduce Richard Rueda of the APH Career Connect Center. Uh, I knew Richard from his time at the California School for the Blind. Shout out, Richard. Uh, to, to our school and our time together. Um, but now you're the digital content manager at the Career Connect at APH. And I appreciate and we'll let you introduce your, your co-panelist here for this next segment. Thank you both for joining us. All right, uh, Andres, are you there? I am here, Richard. Did I say your name correctly, Andres? That's correct. All, All right. Are we, uh, are we starting now, Adrian? Or are we waiting to the top of the hour? You are ready to roll. All right. Well, this is, um, and we have half an hour, correct? Yes, we okay. are rolling all the way through 1025. 1025. All right. We have about 28 minutes to make it work. And of course, my phone would start ringing when I, when I started this. Let me put that on mute. Um, well, good morning, Andres. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here at the Coding Symposium. Sorry, I sound a little nasally, uh, bad allergies this week, but I'm excited to uh, be a part of the event and, and from what we do at Career Connect, this is kind of a, a very abbreviated version of what we do with career conversations each month. So I have the pleasure of talking with Andres Gonzalez this morning. He's the senior software engineer with Apple Incorporated in Cupertino. Uh, Andres is with us today to uh, just field some questions from me and maybe some questions from the chat. Um, we're really going to focus on Andres' personal experiences as a blind software engineer and scientist. Um, so good morning, Andres. Welcome. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you so much to APH for inviting me. It's, a, it's an honor for me to be with all of you. I especially enjoyed that last panel. I was able to, to, to listen to it and it was a, a great panel. My hat off to, to John, and Steve and Peter. Yes, it was really good. I got on about five minutes after the hour. Uh, Andres, I thought it would be a good starting point for us to hear about who you are as a blind person, as a software engineer, as a scientist, and why you got into the field and, and what influenced you? What were some of the influential factors that got you into why you are doing what you're doing now? Well, uh, I started my career as a scientist. I, I was a mathematician uh, out of school, and I started working in brain research neuroscience in, in a research center. Uh, of course, during my years at, at, at the university and, and then as a young researcher, I, I felt a great need for assistive technology. You know, I had to work with computers, I had to read papers and books and none of that was in braille or audio format for me. So it, I got into the assistive technology industry by need, uh, by needing that assistant very much so. When I came to the US, I, I should say I'm originally from Cuba. I was born and raised in Cuba, I went to school in Cuba. Okay. From the University of Havana, uh, the mathematics school. And, and pursue a master's degree in mathematics in, in, in the Cox University in Paris. So through, through all my schooling and as a junior researcher, I struggle with, 
not having assistive technology. So when I had the, the opportunity to come to the US, uh, I said, well, a golden opportunity for me would be to work developing this technology that I so much have needed over the years. And I was lucky enough to, to have that opportunity. And, and I've been working uh, in assistive technology and accessibility for over 20 years now with different companies. I started working with uh, Hendrick Joyce and Film Scientific. Oh yeah. I, in JAWS. I work at Adobe. And in the last uh, years I've been working with Apple. So I'm a senior so software engineer on Apple and I work primarily in web accessibility. Uh, so the web is so important to all of us and, 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 and contributing to that effort making the web more accessible and voiceover. <laughs> yes, and very impressive resume as I was looking it over this morning. Again, can you talk to us a little more about some of the, the, in, the mentors or role models you had, if you had any coming into this field? And likewise, did you have any doubts? Were there people who said, no, you, you won't be able to do this. You're blind. This is impossible. And, and how did you overcome those, those stigmas, those barriers? Sure, I've had many role models uh, through, through, throughout my life. I, I wanna make a special mention to my teachers uh, throughout the years. I, I, I have a, a great respect for, for the profession of teaching. I think it's a, a crucial to our society. Um, um, I particularly rec remember uh, very fond fondly, uh, my math teacher in junior high school. It was the first time I discovered I, li I liked mathematics, and he encouraged me uh, to take part of you know math contests and and push me hard to to get better at math. And and through 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 all my my years at school, I I I, I draw a lot of inspiration from my teachers. Uh, uh, at the University of Havana, I remember my, my tutor, my thesis, my undergrad thesis was my, my professor of a, a discipline called measure theory in, in pure mathematics. Uh, and he, he was constantly encouraging me. And he said, you know, you are not going to get the top grade, which was five. You're not going to get five in my class unless you actually do something innovative. You prove a theorem. You create a new, you know, prove a new theorem. Sure. And I try and try. I didn't. I couldn't. I, I got a four. I didn't get my top grade in that class. But I learned a lot of measure theory in my career. <laughs> so even when I failed to, to meet that expectation, I, I really appreciate that my professor pushed me and encouraged me all the way through and and, and I learned a lot of that uh, part of pure mathematics that have served me in so many other ways. Yeah, as, as for the second part of your question, yeah, I found many times uh, through my, my career moments where uh, many people have told me, oh, you know, you, you cannot do that or, or that is too difficult or or at times I even thought oh this is so hard and that's that's you know the an honest answer that I that, that I that I can give you however <clears throat> my philosophy has always been well I gotta find a way I gotta yeah. find a way a, an alternative way a, when let's say that if a piece of software that I have to use is not accessible. Uh, you always have to find a way to, to use it in a different way. Part of that, as somebody mentioned in the, in the, in the previous panel, uh, very rightly, is ask for help. Uh, people are always willing to help. Uh, people are very kind uh, and, and don't be shy about asking for help. I, in the same token, uh, we, we are all good at certain things and not so good at others. So if you know that you're good at something, I, I'm not sure you all are, 
uh, be, be also always willing to help every time you can. So it goes both ways. Ask for help when you need it, offer help when you can and, and help others. And that will create the best experience and the best relationship, both at your school, at your workplace, at your team. It, it, it always goes both ways. So Andres, I'm hearing step out of your comfort zone. Don't be shy. Ask for help. Ask for assistance um, when, you, when you need it. Absolutely. And so in your experience in the field for the past 20 or so years, have you been able to give back? Have you been a mentor or a role model to others, uh, knowing directly or indirectly, where people have reached out to you? Hey, can you help me become as smart as you or become as successful as you are in, in what you're doing? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that I tell people, oh, I can help you to be smart because I, I, don't, I don't see myself like that. Uh, I, <clears throat> what, I, what I advise uh, to, to, to everybody, to my son, to uh, my son's friends, when I go talk to, uh, to, to his class, uh, to, to my teammates is, I think perseverance is is uh, is something that we need to work on. Yes, uh, as individuals, and don't give up. Uh, if you if you really strive in in, in in your goals, you you will achieve. You you go some somewhere. Uh, the key is to try and try hard. Uh, never give up. So that, that that's my my main advice. P pursue what you what you dream of, what you are interested in, what you think you have a passion for, uh, and do try, do try. Even when it's hard, uh, find a way uh, to do it differently, to, to do it, uh, to, to work it around, and, and you'll see that, that you, you get to places. Sometimes you don't get exactly to what you envision, in the past, but you can get to even a better place. Uh, you, you, you will be uh, some, many, many times you're going to be surprised uh, uh, favorably. Andres, talk to us about, um, there are people out in the audience who are job seekers who are interested in coding. They might be in the beginning or somewhere advanced, but they're still looking for that that leg up that assistance that role model that mentor where do they start if if you are someone in the audience and you're just you don't know who to turn to to get to network to kind of break into the field what what advice do you have for for those folks well i would say you're at school your teachers are your 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 greatest resources you, you have to go to your teachers ask for help ask for guidance uh, as many other panelists mentioned before, the internet is a great resource. Uh, you can find all kinds of self-teaching materials on, on the internet. Uh, I, I think one, well, one thing I would like to, 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 to mention, uh, and, and I haven't listened to the previous panel, is that in the high-tech industry, Coding, coding is obviously important, is and, and I realize this is a coding symposium. Yes, I, I don't want to take anything away from that. But in our industry, in the software computer industry, there are many roles that are critical to to the industry. Uh, yes, some some fundamentals of coding and how things work are important, but there are many roles that are critical in our day-to-day -day work, work. And I could mention a few like, you know, testing, designing, marketing, sales, and many others. I, I, I don't wanna exclude. So if you're interested in, in high tech, in software, computers in particular, uh, there are many variants, uh, and many career paths that you can pursue that are extremely important and very uh, critical to the, to the industry and to, to our society. 
So coding is one of, the, of them. I'm a coder. I, I code every day. Uh, I, I, that's my job. I do a lot of coding and, and review other, other engineers coding codes. So that, that's what I do in, in a daily basis. I, I do a lot of design, a high level design and, and some architecture as well. But uh, I work with many colleagues uh, that, that I highly value that perhaps don't do a coding every day. But uh, just to give you an example, you know, quality engineers uh, that, you know, check the quality of the products, that test things, that help design the features. Uh, in the case uh, of uh, blind engineers, yeah. many, many of our engineers don't know many times how things should work for a blind user, for example. And if you are a blind engineer, you may have that knowledge. Uh, you can uh, share that knowledge via, you know, functional specs, writing documentation, uh, providing feedback when, when you test the features. So there are many ways of getting into the high tech software computer industry and be very successful and very helpful to the, to the general effort. And thank you, Andres. Um, I was I was looking at the chat earlier, and there was a question early on about spanning back to your twenty years or more in the in the industry. Are, are there projects or things that you are proud of that you were a part of that you you led that you could talk about and and why it was successful? Maybe not the specifics, but just why it was successful and, and what you're most proud of, like an achievement. You know, I love my job, so I, I, I really enjoyed every stage in my career. As I said, from, from working in JAWS for Windows to, to working now at Apple and, and everything in between. So I, I'm, I'm very, very, um, uh, very pleased and, and blessed uh, with uh, my career. The thing I enjoy the most and it makes me get up in the morning and come to work every morning is the fact that we are pushing the envelope, if you will, uh, creating uh, innovation, innovative solutions to help people in their lives, uh, whether you are at school, working or pursuing your, uh, your, your career or even if you are just enjoying enjoying your life, you know, listening listen to music or movies or or playing games, I think uh, the, the 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 technology revolution in the last decades ha has been very transformative in in our society, and uh, that's what keeps me on my toes, uh, getting up every day, knowing that in a, in a very modest way, I'm contributing to that effort, the effort of uh, creating new technologies that impact uh, people's lives and in particular people with disabilities uh, because I'm also a user of uh, what we do uh, in, in the accessibility and assistive technology uh, field. So it is very rewarding, it's very uh, encouraging for me uh, to work in this field. Um, and along those lines, um, two part question and, and real um, something I like to ask a lot of our our guests, what do you like, what challenges you most about being a software engineer or scientist and what do you like most about being that and I think you had asked address that just now but if there, you want to expand upon that, uh, as people look into this, oh. this type of work, coding, scientist, software mm -hmm. engineer. Yeah. Um... There are always challenges. Um, I'm going to give you a, a brief a personal anecdote outside technology. I, I have a son. Uh, when he was in, in elementary school, we did a program uh, that I highly recommend for, for parents and fathers out there that is called Y Guides. Uh, the letter Y Guides. It's part of the YNCA uh, Organization, I believe. Why guides G U I D E S? Yes. Gotcha. It's, it's okay. A, a youth, why for youth guides? Okay. Yeah. And in that program, uh, you know, you 
you and your child, it can be your boy or your girl, uh, do a lot of activities. And my little boy, he was in elementary, I think he was seven, eight years old. And he was, uh, you know, a little, very competitive boy. Um, amongst the many activities we did with other parents and, and boys, fa fathers and boys, was a, a competition where, you know, the, the, the father and the child will partner. And we were a little bit of in, the, well, not a little bit, we were in disadvantage because I couldn't see. So my, my boy being, as I said, a competitive seven, eight years old, he started complaining, oh no, I'm in this, he wanted to win, of course. And he said, oh, I'm, right. I'm in disadvantage here because my dad cannot see. And I said, hey, wait, wait, wait. We will we'll find a way uh, to, to, to participate and to have fun. Um, perhaps we, we have to work a, a little harder. And that's why that message that I tried to convey to that a years old is a, has been a guiding, a guiding line in my life. And, and I, I like to share that with all of you. Yeah, sometimes you have to work a little harder. There, there is no way around in that. Uh, uh, sometimes you have to find ways so have to, uh, sometimes you have to, to, to spend a little more time that you work, do you you work money uh, you that somebody else would have to, but I, I think it's worth very worth the effort. I, I think the uh, uh, the results of hard work and dedication uh, may make uh, make it up uh, in in great in great uh, in great measure. So if you are willing to put a little sacrifice into this field, I, I assure you I, that it's worthwhile, your effort and, and your sacrifice. I've got about three or four more questions and we've got about eight minutes left. Um, Andres, what legacy do you hope to leave uh, as a software engineer, as a scientist who's working in, in the industry doing really cool and, and awesome things? Well, I, I like to think about this in terms of what are we doing collectively? I, I think I've seen over the, 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 over the two decades that I've been in this field, great advances. Uh, when I started in the mid uh, 1990s, the situation for, in particular for blind users was much more dire in terms of accessing digital information. I, I think we have made great strides uh, and, and great progress uh, uh, as an industry. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm glad to be part of that. Uh, I'm very proud of or have contributed in my, in my modest uh, way to that uh, general effort. So to me, that, that's a, 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 my, my, my personal pride. I, I'm, I'm, I pr I'm, I'm, pr I'm proud to tell my friends and, and my relatives to, that, that I work in accessibility, that I help uh, to make computers and, and software more accessible for, for blind people and, and people with disabilities. Yeah, and and you know, and and thank you for being with us this morning or afternoon, depending on where folks are. I, I um, we we see this all the time. The unemployment rate is over seventy percent uh, in the blind and disability community. What are your thoughts on that? Should everyone become a software engineer? Is that going to solve that? I mean, you're making things easier for people to access. How do we how do we bring that number down? Oh. I I, th I think that's, that's the key. I, <clears throat> uh, earlier you asked about role models for me and I mentioned my teachers and I also want to mention a pens a per another person that is, uh, his name is Ted Hunter. He was the founder of, of Hunter Joyce and, and the yes. creator of, of Jaws for Windows. Uh, and I liked, uh, uh, Ted was a great, great inspiration for me, Ted Hunter, and 
uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity he gave me to, to start in software development. Uh, and Ted uh, called Jaws job access with speech. Yes. Uh, and to me, that, that, that was a, that was a, a, a stroke of genius there because I, I think employment gives dignity. I think employment and, and having a job is, uh, is key to the, the right and the opportunity to, to have a job is, is key to, to human dignity. And I really hope that, that in the coming years, we improve in the US and around the world in making, in, in having more people with disabilities and particularly more blind people integrating into the workforce. And I think technology has opened opportunities that we didn't have before. The fact that I can do my daily job in a, in a computer uh, as efficient as anybody else, as, and as productive as anybody else, I, we, we didn't have that opportunity uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and the, the, it's up to, up to us, to, to, to all of us, uh, to take advantage of, of those, those opportunities. I think education also plays an important role. I, I know APH does a, a great job in that respect. Uh, and I, I commend you for that. Uh, literacy, I, I'm also a big uh, advocate for Braille literacy. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> Braille has been very important in my professional career. I use Braille every day in my Braille displays. Uh, it helped me with math, being a mathematician. Uh, uh, at the time, I, di I didn't even know the Nemeth code. I didn't even know that existed sure. when I was in Cuba studying math. But I, I had to invent my own code to, to write, you know, integrals yeah. and, and all of that. So I'm, I'm a big advocate for, for Braille literacy. I think we should teach him more data in school. In yes, math, science, coding. Um, not to say that for being a good coder or, or you have to use Braille. I, I've known very successful programmers, blind programmers that don't use Braille. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's important that yes. we improve that in that area as well. Andres, you've given us a lot to think about today, and, and thank you. I've got one question. We were looking at Andres, the scientist and software engineer, but sometimes the, you're, the best thinking, the best solutions to work problems happen outside of work. So what is, what is Andres Gonzalez like outside of work? What do you do for fun? And, and, and we'll, leave you, uh, we'll end with that question. What do you like to do when you're not at work? Well, th those are a few hours of the day when I'm not at work. Um, and it's my family. My family is uh, the center of my life. I have a, a teenager now. He's in 11th grade uh, uh, and a wife. And I, I, I love spending time with them. Uh, I love music. My, my, my boy also plays music, although he has lately chosen to play more sports than music. He's in the <laughs> in the lacrosse team. So I spent time going to all the lacrosse games. Uh, he's there you in the, go. In the high school team. Uh, yeah, family. Uh, family is important. My other, my other, I, I should say my first job. <laughs> right. Well, we talk about work-life balance as much as we talk about getting a job. So thank you for sharing that insight with you, uh, with us. Uh, and thank you for being with us today, Andres. It's been a pleasure interviewing you. Uh, thank you for all that you do. And um, you have a great day now. Thank you, Richard. And thanks again to APH for the event. Wonderful. It's our pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Richard. Uh, that was a fantastic conversation and a fantastic uh, insight into your professional career and life. And we appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, before we we before we squeeze into our next presenter, I wanted to remind everybody to check out our website, not only our resources, um, but also our awards uh, and our STEM scholarships. 
Um, we have awards available to all student attendees uh, given to us graciously from APH, Vespero, and Humanware. Uh, if you are a student in our audience, please fill out the awards entry form and you will be eligible for a prize worth up to $3,000 from one of those companies from APH, Humanware, or Vespero uh, to aid you on this journey on discovering technology and learning coding and programming. There are also uh, STEM scholarships available on our webpage um, and another opportunity from one of our partners, the Fox Family Foundation is also in our award space. Um, we're gonna move on to our next uh, conversation. Sina Baram is the founder and president of Prime Access Consulting and, and it's an inclusive design firm. He's an accessibility consultant, a computer scientist, a researcher, a speaker, and an entrepreneur. Amongst many awards, Sina has been recognized as the White House Champion of Change. He collaborates with the United Nations and World Wide Web Consortium, and he is even on a project to make space and space travel accessible to all. It's a pretty cool list of things, Sina. Uh, thank you very much for joining us during the 2022 National Coding Symposium. Uh, our attendees are composed of students, both blind and low vision. Uh, ranging all the way from elementary, middle, high school, college, and far beyond that. We have many adults in our audience who are interested in potentially changing their careers or are just interested in coding. We have professionals, we have teachers, we have many walks of life in our audience. So I'm excited for them to have an opportunity to talk to you for the next uh, session. Thank you for joining. Well, thank you for having me and thanks for everything that APH and everyone as part of this event is doing to make not only coding but STEM and uh, you know representation of marginalized groups like persons with disabilities uh, better in technology. I think that's incredible work and it's an honor to be here. Um, I uh, really this this session is set up to be the most helpful for the audience that you just spoke about and so I can give a little bit of background on myself we heard we heard some bio points I can talk a little bit more about that but then really want to reserve the majority of the time for questions from the audience we're happy you know happy to get a little bit of help facilitating if they're coming in on the chat etc but just to uh, you know make myself available in terms of somebody who is blind who's gone through a computer science education my undergraduate and graduate degrees are in that space. I did a PhD for a little while in computer science. I'm, I'm ABD or all but dissertation in that because I went off to start a consulting company and a, a technology focused inclusive design firm, which I've been running for the last 10 years. And so if there's any questions basically around any of those topics, I'm, I'm happy to speak to them at, at whatever level is just helpful, students, parents, teachers, um, et cetera, or to explain a little bit more about, you know, what we do in this, in this space and how we make these things more equitable and inclusive. So with that, maybe I'll uh, take a look at the chat, but also invite folks, um, you know, whatever your protocol is for unmuting, et cetera, to ask some questions if there are any um, in case that can be helpful. Thank you, Sina. I very much appreciate that. So people start populating questions into the chat. You can also raise your virtual hand uh, and that will allow us to let you unmute yourself. Uh, Sina, I see a couple of questions coming in the chat. I'm happy to read them out. Yeah, I think one of them was where, where did I get my computer science degree? Was that the question? Yes, it is. Um, NC State, so go Wolfpack. Um, uh, NC State is uh, here in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. So I did my undergraduate and graduate work there. I, and I will ask you the question of the week um, that has been asked of all of our presenters is, what's your screen reader? What, what is your primary? <laughs> all, what do you all, all, of, all of them, including the few dozen that I've helped actually uh, create, because when we're doing work in museums, sometimes we're in the business of writing screen readers, very bespoke, very purpose-built screen readers to make things like interactives accessible or embedded systems accessible. So we've actually written some screen readers. And then of course on like window, I'm a Windows user. So for my desktop environment, and then I use a bunch of Linux obviously in the cloud and for servers. So in Windows, I use a combination of JAWS and NVDA. Fantastic. Uh, I see people with their virtual hands up. Um, if we can, uh, let Patrick Callahan uh, unmute and ask your question. Patrick Callahan, uh, you should now be able to unmute and ask uh, Sina a question. There you go, Patrick, you're unmuted if you're able to uh, go ahead and join in and ask your question. Okay. Um, 
I uh, am very impressed with what I'm hearing today. I've been participating in the symposium all week, and um, and I, as I made the question before, I uh, am just new to being low vision person, mm -hmm. and um, I'm trying to learn and start to learn coding, mm -hmm. and um, it's so nice to be able to see so many successful people who are blind and low vision so successful it gives me so much hope and um but uh i am wondering um where does somebody who's 58 yeah electrical engineering degree penn state 86 uh, was in the navy for 20 some years and continued on to that into the IT realm as a scrum master te and tester mm -hmm. and never really had a chance to learn programming because of the timing of milestones in my life. Sure. But um, I am so the, the, the word coding has so like uh, catalyzed my uh, thinking in my engineering background mm -hmm. to man, this is, I, I could see how this can work but I just don't know how to do the keystrokes and I'm yeah. using a program right now called Typeio mm -hmm. and to learn how to uh, touch type. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm finally getting to the point where I can, um, don't need any vision to, yeah. to um, type. That's awesome. But now I'm at that point that I wanna do something next and um, in the process of learning JAWS sure. and, as a screen reader, and yeah. um, and I'm and I and I discovered this word called keystroke command, and um, I'm trying to memorize as many keystroke commands so that I can go in my room sure. and get to YouTube and navigate through it to yeah. uh, listen to different videos, sure. and uh, by not using the touchpad, but by using keystroke commands, and um, but so now I'm at the point is. And I was so intrigued by Python yesterday. Is where does somebody my age start? And yeah, and I no, I, I get don't it. Know. I get it. So okay, a couple of things, right? First of all, right now, you know, everybody's on a different place in that journey, right? So right now, what you're concentrating on is what we would call like you know just computing skills, right? Like using the keyboard, learning how to type, um, touch type, right? Um, it, what are the different ways of doing things like copying and pasting or actuating the file menus or getting into the toolbar or going through lists with the keyboard? And so I would say if that's where you are, I, I would. Oh, uh, hold on one quick note. Is my uh, is my audio audible? You are yes. sounding great, but your video okay. did turn off. How about now? Perfect. Okay, well, go go figure. Um, and so, but thank you for the audible, and please never hesitate to tell, tell me in the future. Um, it, you know, so um, I would concentrate there first. I, I would really, before you dive into coding, let, let's make sure you, you are understanding some of the, the basics in terms of like how these environments work, right? How we switch between applications, how we drive with a keyboard. You said you're learning JAWS, and so learning a screen reader is fantastic, even though you're low vision and can use your vision to do some things, and that's great, you should do that. Sometimes particular actions like reading and quick navigation, that's faster to do with speech. And so hi, coming up with that hybrid solution, I think is, is, is really important. And then to think about coding um, as a way of, uh, you know, exploring further. But I, I would say, you know, first, let's make sure you're like concentrating on keyboarding, on typing, on using applications that work for you, right? On mobile, if you're not an iPhone user, I would encourage you to check out that system, right? And this way, you're going to get more and more understanding, and you're going to build an internal model for how technology technology works in, in your way of interfacing with it now, which is as a low vision person. So how do buttons read? How do checkboxes get 
toggled? How do you order things with an online form? And as you have more and more experience with that, kind of through osmosis, but also through intentional practice on your end, you're gonna you're gonna develop more of an intuition for the system. And that way you're gonna spend less cognitive energy, you're gonna spend less time thinking about, oh, what do I, what's that command again? It's gonna be muscle memory. And so it's like playing an instrument. You wanna build up that muscle memory and then start exploring things like coding or start exploring things like technical materials. And for that, I would say, and I, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna cut this answer a little short because I know we have some other questions in the chat, but what I would say is uh, definitely I would uh, encourage you to check out uh, either Python or Quorum as your first two um, areas of exploration, but I would hold off on that maybe a little and make sure that you feel comfortable because the last thing I want is for you to try coding as a low vision person and then to get discouraged by it but not because it's hard or because you're not capable of doing it. It's it's far from the truth. It's because the other skills aren't where you need to be yet. So before you start trying to play, you know, like a nocturne by Chopin, you know, you got to practice your scales on the piano. And so that's, I think, something that's really important. But don't don't uh, take it off the table for yourself. I just want you to go through that sequence so that you are setting yourself up to win, right? But I know we have some some other questions. Happy to do like a follow up on that. But just uh, I just want to be fair to to, to everybody to, to get to some to some questions. But I hope understood. That message helps received, and I thank yeah. you. No, thank you. And by the way, I'll and I'll be sharing contact info. But if you've got some follow ups and such, or anything I'm talking about, if you know like a link or something would be helpful, I'm happy to send that stuff out. And that goes for everybody. Um, just so APH can distribute, and we can make sure you know people aren't frantically trying to Google something. We'll make sure to send out links and everything. So gotcha. appreciate that, Sina. Appreciate your your question, Patrick. That really summarized a lot of students' perspectives as yes. well. Like I'm excited about this, but it's a little hard to jumpstart. Um, thank you, thank you both. We have a question in the chat um, about Please. when when you were on the job market or talking to people on the job market. What suggestions do you have for showing employers your computer science capabilities and your skills that you do have? Um, it's an interesting one. So uh, I've hired engineering teams for various companies, including my own. And so I can answer that question both as like an applicant that has applied for some of these jobs and then also as a hiring, you know, just as an executive who's been hiring these things. Um, there's a couple of things. One is that I think, uh, you know, on something like a resume, uh, making sure that you're demonstrating work that you've done, if you've been fortunate enough to have that experience, is really important. And that doesn't just mean writing down some bullet points about a previous job or, or about coding that you're doing on your own. It means like putting your code on GitHub, right? Like surfacing the stuff that you're doing and pointing people to that. Even if you didn't do all the coding, some people get shy. They're like, well, I worked on that with a group of people. That's okay. Point to it. It's not like you're taking credit for the whole thing, but just make sure that you're surfacing the work and the environments that you've been a part of. Uh, do you participate in any kind of hackathons or any kind of coding clubs? Um, you know, what are, what's a hobby that you're working on? Um, one time we were at a startup. This is about, um, Oh gosh, this is like uh, 17 years ago. And one of the really interesting things was that this engineer was applying for a job and they were they were pretty good. But what really sold us on them was they actually started geeking out about their home hobby project. And it was really cool. They're like, yeah, and I got this embedded microprocessor and I was coding it, et cetera, et cetera. And that like sort of gave us that info of, oh, this is somebody who like really loves the tech and likes playing with it and seeing what's possible. And that was kind of the spirit we wanted. You know, it wasn't just about the technical skills or about the GPA and things, those things are important when you're in school, but when you're in the real world, right, like it's about the experience and about your willingness to just be, be happy to try new things and to apply your problem solving skills to it. And if you don't have as much experience, think about the experience you do have in problem solving. Persons with disabilities, right? Disabled folks are the best problem solvers on the face of the planet, hands down. Right? There's no other group of people that are better than solving problems than persons with disabilities. And the reason is because we have to solve problems every single hour of every single day just to exist in a deeply disabling world. And so therefore, surfacing those kinds of points, but in a, like a positive way with employers is another way of showing I'm a problem solver and the technology and the engineering skills are the language that I can use in which to solve problems that that employer may care about.
Wonderful. Sina, I have a captioning note from our captionist. Uh, Slow down. We don't know the behind the scenes. We use dictated captioning. And so somehow she's managed to keep up with you. <laughs> well, that is my hat tip to you. And if I speak fast in the in the future, don't hesitate to interrupt. But I will I will attempt to uh, modulate and slow down in terms of velocity. Uh, so wonderful. my thanks my thanks to your fingers. Um, wonderful. We have a uh, a question personal to you. What what's your what's your jam in the programming world? What do you mainly code with? <laughs> what, what code language do you use? You know. These days, I'm not doing too much coding just because uh, uh, I am running a couple of different companies. Um, we've got staff internationally in different time zones. And, you know, so I'm doing a lot more on the on the management side and running projects, helping, you know, make museums and things like that more inclusive. I do review code from time to time, of course, and we then, you know, advise on standards. When I'm in that world, it's a lot of web technologies. So think HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and the backend technologies that facilitate that. So think Python. And and technologies like that. Um, the other important thing is that these things change over time. So what I would encourage you to do is not just stick with one, but learn the concepts, right? If Python's your jam, do cool stuff in Python. If you want to play around with Quorum and make accessible 2D and 3D games and all the amazing statistics stuff that's coming out in the data science release they're doing right now, play with that. But I would just encourage you to get experience playing with it, some different technologies. And if you only know one programming language, I would encourage you to learn that second one because that's when you really get the concept transfers of, oh, C++ does it this way, Python does it this other way. And that's when you really get to, to learn the differences of how we build technology. I think that's it. That's the nutshell right now for the coding symposium as a whole. It's not just the first one, it's the second one, the generalized. Um, we will get to Karina. We'll ask you to unmute in a moment, but you mentioned it just briefly and we had a question. Uh, the question is, can blind folks complete in data science jobs? Yes. Next question. Simple. <laughs> yes, wait, bring it. Go for it. Karina, Karina Nunez. Uh, you have uh, your microphone enabled now. So Karina, go ahead and unmute and go ahead and ask a question of Sina. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. My question is, I recently graduated with a bachelor's in individualized studies. Congrats. And I'm wondering if that's in, of any value in the coding areas. What was the studies? Bachelor's of individualized studies, so basics. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, understood. So it's so like general ed, right? And then you're asking, how do I go from there into coding? Is that is or into tech in general? Is that your question? Yes, I'm really good with tech stuff. And okay, as a so, blind, completely blind person, I've used it for so long. <laughs> absolutely. So this depends on what you want to be doing. What are the things in tech that resonate with you? For example, there's coding. That's like the easy thing to talk about. But that's only if you really think about it, like, I don't know, 10% of technology jobs, right? Maybe there's project management. There is um, the uh, uh, account you know, management side of things. There's client relationships where you need to know how to speak tech so that you can be the conduit between the people who have requirements like customers or clients and the people making that stuff like the engineers and the designers and the researchers, right? Um, there's other jobs in tech like communications and um, uh, you know, like managing things like social media, but then how do you like go, you know, you, you start there just to get some experience because you don't have a technical degree, but it'll give you an excuse to get that like technical experience in a technology focused area. And then to use that as a springboard to say, oh, you know what, when we were doing that project and I was working on, oh, I don't know, uh, user research evaluation, or I was working on evaluating accessibility for a company, that was fun. I want to do more of that. So it gives you like exposure to test the, the field, if you will. So what I would say to you is like, get a job that may be technology adjacent, but that gives you enough experience to kind of sample around. And then maybe if it's worth it, and I'm not saying you have to do this, but if it makes sense, think about getting a master's degree once you've identified that area you want to do more in, because that will help with things like salary and getting more senior positions and things like that. But you don't have to have a master's in order to be in tech. Frankly, a lot of folks I know in tech dropped out of college. I've actually had experience in minor tech support for young oh, awesome. people. Yep. 
Yep. In fact, uh, I'll tell you one thing. A lot of people who got started back in the day, especially like IBM had a really good flow for this. They would get started in QA and testing. Then they would go get hired by the engineering team because it's the people they'd been working with for two or three years. They were filing bugs on one end and then they transitioned over, taught themselves coding and then started fixing those bugs on the other end. And that's a very popular flow for people where if you don't get the coding job or you don't have those skills yet, first go get the testing and QA job and then work your way into the org that way. So that's one strategy that has worked in the past. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. I think uh, I've, I've heard this theme throughout the entire week of, uh, of start, start somewhere that's accessible to you, but also discover what's a need that you're interested in. Uh, mm -hmm. Sina, Sina referenced it, but I know, Sina, you've done some really good work with accessibility in the museum space. Oh, uh, yes, we, we build them now. <laughs> there's a need everywhere in every yeah. field. So if you have an interest, uh, you can go down that field path rather than specific. Absolutely. Movie. Absolutely. And remember, technology is just the amplifier. It is a magnifying glass. It makes the good stuff awesome. It makes the bad stuff really terrible. And so don't, you know, think of technology as a means uh, to the end uh, of an end or as an objective. Honestly, it's just a tool that as humans, we use to amplify our own efforts and, and then decide where in tech you want to use that, uh, you know, use those efforts for good. We have a question in the chat that I had to Google myself, and I originally thought, oh, that's a high tech question. And then I thought, you know what, we all interact with Googles and that Amazon device, which I won't call by name. Uh, sure. But it was about the field of NLP, natural yeah. language processing. What's um, the question? Could you, could you first describe that in a sentence or two? Sure. And the question is, is that accessible to blind and VI people? The second part is absolutely yes. So that's the easy part. Um, there are some ways of doing it. But first, let me explain what NLP is. Natural language processing is when you're when a computer can understand natural language. So as I'm speaking right now, let's say we have a sentence like Kate goes to the store. Well, there's all these things. Remember back in grade school when you had to diagram sentences? Kate goes to the store. What's the verb? Goes. What's the noun? Well, Kate is a noun and store is a noun. We're going to come back to that. What is the, you know, noun phrase, the store? What is the verb phrase, going to the store? What is the operation being done? Kate goes, right? So you, you, ha you have to teach a computer English. And once it knows English, you can ask things like, is it raining outside? And it's not just doing keyword matching, right? It's actually understanding, oh, you're asking about the outside weather. You want to know about rain. Therefore, I'll let you know the weather forecast, right? This is how things like those voice assistants work. And then you can get even more complicated. You can start doing semantic inference. Kate is a noun. It's a proper noun, must be a person. Right. And so then you can start doing things like, well, what if we talk about persons? Can we look that person up in our contact list? This is what your phone does. That's what that's all that's happening when you do voice commands or even when you're chatting with a chat bot. They're breaking the sentences down and then using complicated techniques like machine learning and other things to understand what you're asking. And the better we are at getting computers to understand us, the better that we can, you know, we can we can like make them easier to use. So that's what NLP is, and you absolutely can do it. A lot of the coding is done in things like Python, and it involves machine learning, um, but it's a lot of text-based stuff, which is wonderful. Thank you, Sina. Um, I see a question in the chat, which we will get to in a moment, but we might save it to finish on. Um, Yana Small, uh, you now have permission to unmute your microphone, if you'd like to unmute and ask Sina your question. Uh, hello, everyone, Sina and uh, everyone else. I, I've been attending this, was listening to this symposium all week, and I'm just a grown up and uh, I'm trying to learn to code myself. I just decided to do it. Awesome. It's so amazing to hear how many people actually are successful. It's so amazing to know that people organize things, um, uh, events like this symposium. And I understand the main focus is, of course, for the young people, students, right, to motivate, to, to to let them know that uh, there is a big, big chance in life and um, they should yeah. try it. But um, as a blind person, I have two sighted children. Uh, they're very young and I don't mm -hmm. know whether or not they will be interested in this at all. But right now it's my interest. It's, right yeah. now it's my challenge that I uh, created for myself. I'm yeah. trying to teach myself. And I used to be an ESL teacher. I learned mm -hmm. English uh, 
Um, now I just, I, I know, I like to learn languages. I know yeah. how to learn languages and learning a programming language is something that I can do. But then um, accessibility, learning tools to apply my knowledge is where I uh, trip yes. up and uh, this is where the problem is. Uh, whether or not it will happen, but I have a chance right now to raise two people who mm -hmm. may, because they already yeah. know how to live in the coexist next to a blind person yes. maybe they will grow up maybe they will want to go in this area uh, in this field Absolutely. because i've heard a lot of um a lot of people mention that uh, uh we blind people we blind users blind uh, programmers yeah, yeah. engineers uh, we, we we could help sighted people um help us right yeah. and uh i would like to learn to do it myself and maybe teach them or get them interested yeah. in learning this too and later uh, grow up and also start helping other people like me. Um, as I said, it's good to to help young people. But is there anything uh, for adults like me? There were other people that ask questions. Um, for instance, uh, of course, uh, internet, of course, YouTube, of course, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, but, but something specific um, that's aimed at learning coding as an adult, but then also being cognizant of like yeah. your kids maybe coming along for the journey. Right, it, learning mostly not so much the languages, the program, the concepts, okay. because that we can do ourselves. Okay. But for instance, uh, technology that lets us do it, tools that let us do it. Ah, because right now my biggest okay. problem is uh, IE, uh, IDEs, uh, text editors. Sure. Sure. It's hard for me without Absolutely. any guidance to find what will work for me. I see. Yesterday got... I watched uh, Ken Perry's presentation about Python and he's an amazing sure. student. I fell in yeah. love with that idea. If If someone could, make something create something oh, they, maybe they some have teaching. they this yeah. exists yep this exists so it's yeah. called quorum studio and quorum studio is a free ide that is fully accessible and um it is uh it able it's a fully fledged programming language you can do anything you want in it too in 3d gaming robots just the whole thing uh speech output it's all accessible and it's something that has curricula um available online as well and we can share the link but this way it's an environment that not only you can use but because it's a full ide uh, and a mature one your kids can use it as sighted users as well and what i would encourage you to do is actually to go through those lessons with your kids they may use different ones that you may use different ones but you'll be using the same underlying technology you'll know it's fully accessible for you and also because of quorum's accessibility support you can show them through example uh thank you for posting the link in the chat you can show them with examples how they can write games that you can play how they can write an art visualization thing that they're interested in that you can perceive and so in this way you're also walking that journey of inclusive design and accessibility with them while also being in different places in your respective coding journey. So I would encourage you to check out Quorum. It's got a good community. There's a Slack uh, for communications and group, you know, email lists, all that good stuff. So that I would definitely point you there because it sounds like it'll check a lot of your boxes and all the curricula is free and available online. Thank you. Thank you. Sina, I hate to cut any of these things short. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in, the, in a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, do, I'll do questions. lightning round answers. If you want to rattle Light. them off, I'll, I'll, I'll do some, some easy. Absolutely. Uh, somebody's interested in accessibility testing. How do they get started in that space? Um, that is, uh, <laughs> that may not be a lightning answer. Um, essentially, um, get good about learning the specs, spe specifications first, right? So WCAG is WCAG, you can Google that. There's also the ARIA specification, A-R-I-A. A lot of accessibility testing first requires mm -hmm. that you know those things so that you can speak the language of, oh, you can't just say this button doesn't work. Why doesn't the button work? And how do we fix it? How should it be labeled? How should it react for a sighted user that relies on focus highlighting? What should the colors be so that someone can perceive it? Is color only the way of conveying information or is other textual information provided? It's things like that. So I would first get good about understanding those requirements and the starting place is WCAG or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. But that's not the end all and be all, that's just a, a, the first step. And then it's applying that in helping people to, um, you know, to actually uh, make their software more accessible. Right. Two more questions. One, the next one is, 
how do you deal with finding accessible spaces on the internet? The specific question is about uh, data analysis and analysis mm. for career jobs. But when you're going along that path and you need information from the internet yeah. and you run into inaccessibility, it's tough. what do you do? It's tough. I mean, seriously, like, let's just name that and and make sure we're all on the same page about it. It's hard um, because there's a lot of inaccessible stuff out there. I mean, in graduate school, I didn't even have access to the math, right? I had to help invent the mechanism for making the math accessible. I didn't have access for maps, so I had to help invent that, right? So it, it is, it's difficult. Knowing the coding helps you overcome that stuff. I was on an uh, airline, the button to let me have a Wi-Fi access, they had broken it. It was just a JavaScript bug on their end. I couldn't actuate it with the keyboard so I couldn't get online. Luckily, I knew enough JavaScript to put a little one liner in the address bar and I wrote some code to click the button for me because I couldn't do it as a keyboard user who was blind. So knowing coding sometimes helps you overcome those accessibility issues. So it's a very cool, you know, superpower that way. But then also it's talking with friends, attending you know, symposia like this one and forming those community groups because we need to rely on one another to share those resources. And don't underestimate, I know it's old school, do not underestimate the power of a good email list and, you know, a good like group of people on Twitter and a good WhatsApp group to just trade ideas back and forth. And then once you learn something cool, be good about sharing those resources out with people so they can benefit from your learnings as well. Well said. One last question in the quick minute that we have. Tina, what specifically are you doing to make space travel accessible? <laughs> That's a little bit of a I, There's only a few things I can talk about publicly, but imagine all the mistakes we've made here on Earth. Just think about airplanes and how terrible they are in every conceivable way for many persons with disabilities. These are all, they have nothing to do with money. They have nothing to do with engineering. They have nothing to do with design. They have to do with the lack of consideration and will at the beginning of projects, whether it's building an airplane at Boeing or whether it is aviation policy and regulations um, that make these environments deeply disabling and incredibly othering, right? So what we're doing with space is as these new things are being built, whether they're spaceships, uh, whether they are space stations, or whether they're other habitats intended to exist on planets uh, like Mars or uh, on lunar you know, bases, we want to make sure that those environments are built inclusively. So just like how we're working with like the Obama folks on making the Obama Presidential Center accessible or making various museums around the country and the world accessible, applying those principles in space. Imagine turning in zero G, you don't know as a blind person, your inner ear is not going to tell you. So you can get turned around in a hallway. But what if there was unidirectional fabric on the wall so that as your pinky finger just reaches out, you know that you're going in the opposite direction? What about sound cues? What about vibration and tactility on your belt or on your chest and as part of your tunic so that you would have sensors that can respond to the environment? What about latches for somebody who doesn't have arms to use to navigate in space, but has a prosthetic hook and can navigate a microgravity environment? So it's considerations like this, layering speech and sonification into these interfaces so that it helps everybody, not just disabled folks, but astronauts that may be busy with an instrument panel or an emergency and making sure we're building multi-sensory environments. So that's that's some of the things that we're doing. And I would encourage everybody on here, um, if you're over 18, to apply for Mission Astro Access because applications are open until June, I want to say June 3rd or 4th. Um, and that is the program that I applied for last year where I got to go do the zero G flight and do all of those things. So that, that would be another way of getting involved in that stuff. Sina Bahram, you are fun. You're highly, <laughs> highly intelligent and have so many resources and you've taken advantage of so many of these things in your life and learned so much. Um, you're inspirational and I can't wait for the 2000 something National Coding Symposium when you join us from a space station. That's, that's, that sounds amazing. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> let's, let's do it. Mark, mark your calendars, people. 2000 future. Awesome. Uh, we'll, we'll be coming live from a space station. We are going to take, thank, thank you so much. Sina. That was of very course, much thank, you. With, thank you. And seriously, thank you. Your, you had mentioned putting your contact in the chat. Absolutely, I will do so. But really quick, thank you for all that you're doing. And like to everybody here, we're, people like me are only successful because of standing on the shoulders of giants. So like take advantage of those resources. So many of us give back by mentoring and doing things like that. There's incredible people in this community that want everybody to succeed. And I'm, I'm only here because of those people. So thank you. Well said, Fina. Thank you very much. We are going to take a two minute 
stretch break. We're going to start a minute late to get our um, captionist a momentary break. Uh, that she we've run through all of our breaks this morning. Um, so come back at a minute after the top of the hour, and we will start our next presentation um, about an internship that we have at the California School for the Blind in partnership with Good Maps. All right, welcome back from our short break. Um, I'm particularly excited to uh, introduce Jim Blackshear, an orientation and mobility specialist from the California School for the Blind. Uh, Jim has brought to life an internship program uh, between the California School for the Blind and Good Maps. Um, and Jim, along with his intern team, are gonna, gonna give this next presentation. Uh, talking about their experiences getting started in this technology field um, by creating an internship program. So thank you, jo Jim, for joining us from Fremont and the California School for the Blind, and we're excited about this presentation. Thank you, Adrian. I'm really excited to talk about the internship. It's It's been a great experience for me and for the students. And I'll start, we, the students and I prepared a, a slideshow here that I'm going to share. Sorry, just give me one second. No worries on, on figuring out these Zoom Zoom difficulties. Uh, it's been a theme of the week to, to overcome our challenges. Um, You've got it. We are overcoming just as we speak here. Beautiful. Here we go. All right. We can. So let's get started. So we can see it. We're starting here with a photo of us of the internship group standing outside of the classroom. So it's me and the interns. We have Delshawn, Eman, Jaina, and Natalie. We also have the classroom teacher, Kate McGrath, and we have Erica Hogel, my o &M colleague who uh, su supported this program. And it's been a great experience. We have done, we've got a lot accomplished, but I'm gonna start by talking about the background. So earlier in the school year, we were approached by the team from Good Maps and Mike May because they are undertaking a research project where they're, they've reached out to five schools for the blind and the, the research will include about 25 students. And they're tracking over the course of several years how students, um, how students evolve with using navigation apps and specifically their app, Good Maps Explore, and which has the indoor mapping component. And the students have met with some of the researchers over Zoom in the beginning of the internship to be interviewed about how they use apps and how they travel. And the o and specialist also met with the researchers. So the students who are participating in the internship are high school seniors and they attend classes here in Fremont at Newark Memorial High School, their mainstream classes. So they go to class in the morning across town and they come back and after lunch, they participate in other services like O&M. They also have um, a vocational component here at CSB and the students through a program called, um, it's a transition partnership program, a TPP program. It's a relationship with the California Department of Rehab and the students can get paid for on-campus and off-campus jobs with the support of job coaches. And um, we decided to expand on the idea of the students testing out the app and propose that that be um, an internship, a paid internship. So I met with the vocation department and Shannon Johns, the principal from, for the vocation uh, program. And we met with the um, Department of Rehab and we got it approved to be a paid internship. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the responsibilities and duties that the interns had, and then I'm gonna turn it over to them and they're gonna share about more of the things that they did and expand on some of the things that I mentioned here. So the group met weekly. We met every Wednesday afternoon 
and we did app testing among other activities. So sometimes we would pile in a van and we would test out the routing functions on the Good Maps Explore app. And we would um, create points of interest on campus and use the app to navigate back to those. Um, so we tested the app, but we also, uh, the students were also assigned um, another app that they would be comparing to Good Maps Explore. And those apps were Google Maps, Blind Square, Soundscape, and Lazarillo. So the students have been using those other apps, comparing them with Good Maps Explore. At the end of the internship, in a couple of weeks now, they will be reporting back to the team at Good Maps and presenting about their the app that they've been assigned. So they're doing some competitive analysis and they've been working really hard. They do that by um, completing research activity sheets. So there will be um, a research activity sheet for um, evaluating how the app does routes or how the app tells you about points of interest. And they do those um, after school. They can also do those with the support of their o and specialist on uh, O&M lessons. So it's been a collaboration with the O&M department and that has, that has been really supportive. Uh, the students also, so some of the other things that students have done, they've been encouraged by their mentors at Good Maps to actively participate in webinars. So they're encouraged to you know, ask questions at the end of, of the webinars. One of the really interesting ones was when Mike May and Gina Harper uh, reported back after attending the CSUN conference to talk about all of the new technology and accessibility things they learned about. So the students got to, to learn about those things and then ask questions at the end. And that was a great experience for them. So the other things, uh, other components are that they met with their mentors to talk about the research, the ongoing research they've been doing. And they were also tasked to present at the symposium. So they worked hard on creating their notes. And um, uh, one of the students, Jaina, also collaborated with her mentor to create some videos that she will share with you towards the end. So now I'm gonna turn it over to the interns. They're gonna tell you about other components of the internship. And they're also gonna share a little bit with you about working with their mentor. And the first intern that we will, that I'll introduce you to is Jaina. So welcome Jaina. Hello, my name is Jaina Navarro. What is Good Maps? Good Maps is a navigation app designed especially for the blind and visually impaired. Developed by Mike May on March 2019, the app is available for both iOS and Android devices and displays many outstanding and easy to use features like its collaboration with Be My Eyes which is easily accessible by clicking on the big prominent button. Look around mode, which auditorily shares points of interest as well as popular businesses, parks, and landmarks that are around you as you travel. Getting warmer, which gives you the distance and compass directions to a POI without following a specific route. Virtual mode, which allows you to trip plan and explore a new virtual location. But what really makes, but what really makes it, what really makes this app stand out from its competitors is its indoor navigation assistance, which Natalie will get to in a bit. This picture is of all the interns sitting, sitting in their desks, looking at the front of the room where there is a smart board 
where we are Zooming with Joe Streche. During the internship, we had multiple speakers come and talk to us, including Joe Streche. Joe Streche was trained as an O&M specialist and helped with blind rehabilitation. But now he is a television and film producer slash consultant. You may recognize his name from popular titles such as Apple TV's C, The OA, Daredevil, and All the Light We Cannot See. He shared with us his experience as a blind man navigating the working world and gave us some meaningful and encouraging advice on job interviews and how to perfect our elevator pitches. One thing that Shashe said that really stuck with me was, they underestimate us because of our disability. They believe that because we can't see, that we should just sit around and stay hidden. Maybe it's because they don't believe in us, or maybe they're scared. Scared that we will exceed expectations and show them all up. Well, they should be scared because that's exactly what we're going to do. I would also like to take this moment to acknowledge my mentor, Gina Harper. Gina is one of the only blind financial advisors in the world, as well as one of the developers on the Good Maps team. She is truly amazing and I look up to her so much. We of course go over our app research, but we also talk about life. She gives me advice on college success, guide dogs, and how to advocate as a blind female in the professional world. These conversations hold a special place in my heart that I will carry with me throughout the next chapters of my life. Thank you, Gina. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Delshawn. Hi, my name is Del Sean, and I and I'm going to talk about the visit from Elliot. He's a good map. He's a good maps employee that works on that works on indoor mapping. He told he told us about his about his college path and how he and how he got involved in good maps. He also told us about how the technology works, and we even got to get hands on with the technology, but. But Elliot can explain it better than I can. In the in the following video, Elliot, Elliot is walking around mapping West mapping West for his dorm on the CSB campus. I would like I would like to thank my mentor Mike May, the CEO of Good Maps, for for his. I would like to thank my mentor Mike May for the, the CEO of Good Maps for for his guidance during the during this process and for and for supporting me with my with my career goals in computer science. That's great. I'll watch one of the videos now. So we'll now play the videos that Delshawn is, is talking about and give, maybe give a little more description. And that, that's six uh, RGB cameras. So oh six cameras. So they're pointing in all directions. And as I walk, those are capturing an image data set. 
Um, and we use that image data set for the camera-based positioning, which is how we give turn-by-turn -turn directions to users when they're navigating indoors. So when, um, when one of you all are late, when we finish this map and one of you all or somebody you know is here navigating this building, you'll pull your phone out, you'll open up the Good Maps app, and you'll hold your phone out in front of you and point it in the direction you're walking. And it's basically using your phone's camera to compare to compare what your phone sees to all of the images I just captured right now with these RGB cameras. So we have, you know, 20,000 images maybe that I just took in 10 minutes um, in this building. And all those images are all at every angle. So basically, you know. So that video featured Elliot, who visited to map out one of our dorms, and he is wearing the camera on his back. And Joshon, can you describe how the how the camera mm -hmm. looked and felt? The device is strapped. The device is strapped on like a backpack with six cam with with six cameras attached to a number to a number of pro uh, processing components. It weighs about what forty it weighs forty pounds and uh, that's good. So, yeah. yeah, so we decided as a group that it looked like the robot Wally from the Pixar movie. It has um, like a frisbee sized disc on top that's about four inches thick with six cameras pointing out in all directions. And Elliot walks through and it takes thousands of photos. And um, the, the cool part was after he did some of the mapping inside the dorm, we got to go outside where he took it off and the students were able to, you know, to, to explore it firsthand. And I'll play that video now. The top part here that has all the cameras that you sort of felt up here. That, uh, yeah, and you are, yeah, you are it more than welcome to, to touch, like, yeah. That's for the very top. And so the, yeah. that... Oh, so these are all the cameras. Yeah, right these here. are the, the cameras. There's six of these. They point in all different things. directions. So, sure. Yeah, those are where the... I'm mean, assuming this is where, like, it's three. bolted. That, yeah, that's, like, yeah, the yeah, just the housing. That. So yeah, it kind of protects them, and they're all screwed into there. Now I'd like to pass it off to Natalie Charles, who will talk about the professional skills we learned in the internship. Hi, I am Natalie and I am going to talk about some of the career education assignments we did during the internship. We learned about writing professional emails and how important it is for the subject line of an email to reflect what the email is about. We also learned that one closing for an email that almost always works is the word sincerely. We also learned how important it is to be able to talk about yourself because it is usually the first thing that is asked during an interview. We practiced our elevator speeches so, so we would be ready whenever we are asked in the future. Now I am going to talk about our trip to Zellerbach Hall. On the screen is a picture of me and our teacher Kate posing in front of the sculpture at Zellerbach. The field trip to Zellerbach Hall at UC Berkeley was a lot of fun we got to try out the indoor version of Good Maps. Sometimes it got you to places accurately, but not all the time. I discovered that when there is not a lot of light, the app has trouble seeing where you are. Something else that was helpful is that when you were, uh, when you go inside of Zellerbach on the app, a button pops up asking if you want to enter Zellerbach on the indoor, indoor version. Another thing that I discovered was that when you were going to go up a staircase, the app said that you don't have to hold your phone vertically when going up the stairs. 
You can hold it down and then when you get up the stairs, hold it vertically again. I thought that this was important because you have to be careful when walking up the stairs and not get distracted by your GPS app. It also got us to the women's bathroom and the cafe counter accurately. At Zellerbach, we also got to meet some of the employees and one of them had a unique job title. His job was that he was the patron experience manager. We also met Chris, who was the manager of facilities and events. Overall, the experience at a college campus while using the app was good. I think that it was better using the app than how it would be without using the app because it told you which way to go and what turns you had to make to get to where you want to go. I hope more places are mapped and put on the app so then it can be used everywhere, especially college campuses in the future. I would like to thank my mentor, Erin Lauritsen, for taking the time to meet with me. We both have an interest in common, which is reading. Um, I would now passing it back to Jaina, who's going to describe or talk about some of the videos that she created. That's great, Jaina. I am the student social media and marketing assistant here at CSB. Part of my internship responsibilities were to film and take pictures of activities that we all did. Today, I will be sharing with you some videos that I shot and edited from our trip to Sellerbach. The first video is a split screen video. On the left side of the screen, it shows me with my cane in one hand and my phone in the other, navigating through Zellerbach Hall on my way to the homage sculpture. On the right side of the screen is a point of view of my phone displaying the auditory and visual directions. These next four videos are of us interns talking about our experience using Good Maps indoors. As we talk, the video will overlay clips from us in action using the app. I really loved this experience. I've never used a GPS app indoors which was really cool. Uh, it made me feel really strong and independent going to a new place, usually, you know, not only as like a blind person, but you know, generally people in general get lost and insecure when they go to new places. But um, with the app's help, like I found the bathrooms really quickly. I found the cafe, I found the statue. And it's like, I've been there multiple times and I just went straight there and no hesitation. I would say that it is really good when there's not like a lot of things around, like tables and chairs. 
it's really good at getting you to different buildings or places inside a building. But when there are tables and chairs around, it's not really that good. That, that made it feel really good. You know, I I got a chance to explore uh, got a chance to explore like a building without like much assistance, and it felt really you know, like empowering and really good to actually you know just go th go through a building you know once and and get to like learn where things are. It was a really great experience, and I definitely love to use that more in the future. Um, I thought it made me feel pretty confident. Um, knowing where everything is, the app is kind of useful for all that. Um, I got to truly explore good maps. Explore is one of a kind. I'd recommend it for anybody, even for sighted people, um, because everybody gets lost and it's perfect for that. So I'm really proud of all the interns and I'm so impressed with Jaina's videos. The split screen was something I didn't know that you could even do, so that was really cool. I just wanna take this uh, opportunity to thank the mentors again. It's Mike May, Gina Harper, Evelyn Titchener, Aaron Lardson, and Jerry Coons. Special thanks to Kate McGrath, the awesome uh, classroom teacher, and Michael Ortiz, the teacher's aide. Um, also, a big thanks to CSV's ONM department who collaborated during lessons to support the research. Thank you, Bennett Kim from the Department of Rehab for meeting and, and, and making this uh, program possible. And thank you to BlindSquare for the free access to its app. I have some resources that will be made available. There's links to some videos about writing professional emails. There's a sample of one of the research activities the students did a video of Joe Strecce talking about his tell me a little bit about yourself speech tips and some links to some of the podcasts the students and webinars the students participated in, as well as links to purchasing the Good Maps Explorer app. I would also like to say happy birthday to CSB student Mary, who told me she'd be listening. So happy birthday, Mary. Aww. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, CSB students. Thank you, Eman, Jaina, Natalie, um, Delshan. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and really, really welcome your space and your leadership in our space um, as we as we got that opportunity to share your internships at during the coding symposium. Um, you did a good job. I'm sorry we went we went over time a little bit. <laughs> hey. Thanks for some things are worth bending for. If you could disable your share screen, Jim, it'll let us move on to our next speaker. And Austin, if you could turn on your video, um, truly appreciate it. And Jana Navarro leading things at our school at the California School for the Blind, which I'm sure will blend to all schools for the blind of student leadership and social media. Um, that is pretty awesome space. I, if you're if you're a schedule checker, yes, we are running a little bit behind. I'm sure some of that will catch itself up, but if not, we're simply running a little bit behind, and that's okay too. Uh, we have some really positive, fantastic content continuing in the coding symposium this year. Our next speaker is Austin Ther Serafin, presenting a uh, presentation called Three Keys to Becoming a Successful Blind Programmer." Uh, Austin became blind at birth and started programming at a very young age. He has worked on various projects over the years, including, including web and mobile apps, internet, radio, and accessibility tools. He currently enjoys writing open source software and spending his time on ham radio. Thank you, Austin, for joining us for the second year in a row at the National Coding Symposium. The floor is yours. Thanks for having me. Thanks, how am I looking and sounding? Good on both. Oh, wonderful, excellent. All right, thanks everyone. And I'm glad to be back for the second year in a row at the National Coder Symposium. Um, it's great to be back. APH does wonderful work. It's great you're doing this coding thing, um, the coding class. Um, and of course, if you need to get good at math, the great thing that helps is an abacus. Got my APH abacus right here. <laughs> they really do help. Um, all right, so I've been blind since birth. I was born in 1977. And um, now I was thinking back to how it is in high school and college and when you're that age. And um, 
you know, you're under a lot of pressure. I know how it is. And, you know, everyone's asking you like about your careers and what college you're going to go to and stuff. And especially if you're blind, you know, you're just trying to keep your head above water. You know, you're just trying to stay afloat. So um, it is important to have goals, of course, and know where you're going and um, have a vision of the future. But it's really important to create systems of success because then you can just apply them and uh, just over and over again. Um, I'll give you a quick example of a system is the Pomodoro time management system, um, P-O-M-O-D-O-R-O. And um, it's really easy. You work for 25 minutes, take a five minute break. And after four of those half hour periods, you take a longer break and you have a task list, task list and you select the tasks every day and just focus on that. You can look it up. It's an example of a system and it's a good time management system. Um, it's good to learn to estimate your time especially if you have a disability, because things will take longer. So it's important to know how to estimate your time so you won't burn out, so you can um, you know, ration it well, your time and your energy. Um, you know, a lot, of, it's, um, a lot of people, I think, fall into the trap of thinking, well, you know, how can I possibly succeed at, say, computer programming when there are all these great programmers doing all this stuff I've can't even understand and there's all this, you know, and I'm just learning. Well, the way is that um, you don't need to be a master at a topic to succeed. You just need to be good enough at a bunch of different topics and combine them into a, into a stack, into a skill set. Um, for instance, writing and public speaking are good skills that you can just apply to anything. Whatever else you get into, if you can get good enough at writing or good enough at public speaking, you can apply them. And uh, here I am. <laughs> um, so in the case of programming, there are three main things you have to gain some degree of mastery over. And those are your operating system, your programming environment, the development environment, and the programming language or languages that you're using. Um, so I know a bunch of you are going to be taking a course. That's awesome. They're going to be using Windows. A lot of you are using Windows. That's great. It's the most popular operating system. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'm really into Linux. Um, to give you a little quick uh, computer history, uh, when computers started, um, every machine, in essence, had its own operating system, had its own way of programming it. Um, so if you wrote a program, it would only work on one machine. I don't mean one kind of machine. I mean one machine. <laughs> so eventually, programmers realized they had to figure out a way to write programs that would work on different machines. So uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, two programmers at Bell Labs, first created the C programming language. And uh, there are versions of that still in use. C is still in use, C++, C Sharp. All of that came out of this. And they also wrote the Unix operating system to be a portable operating system that would run on any of these machines that could run C. Um, but Unix was trademarked, and uh, but they published the standard. And so then there are different operating systems, different versions of Unix that followed the same standard it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, that kind of a thing. Um, and so over time, we have all these different versions. And then uh, in the 90s, Linus Torvalds from Finland created Linux, which is a version of Unix that runs on the PC. And now pretty much anything, you can put Unix on anything. Before that, you needed specialized hardware. Um, but now you can put Unix on anything. And Unix knowledge, Linux knowledge, or more generally Unix knowledge will come in handy. Um, no matter what, um, if you're in computers, you know, your hobby or your career, whatever you're doing, a little Unix knowledge definitely will come in handy. Uh, it's great for tinkering. Linux is great for tinkering, even if it's not your main thing. It's great for tinkering around and playing with. It's great for bringing old machines back to life. So if you have an old machine that won't run the latest version of Windows anymore, put Linux on it. Bring it back to life and, and start getting into that. And Linux needs accessibility, um, accessibility help. Uh, the Linux accessibility scene needs, uh, needs all the help it can get, and Linux isn't going away, so we need to make it happen. Um, as for the development environment, so I know you're using Microsoft Visual Studio if you're doing the upcoming course. That's cool. A friend of mine and I were just talking about it. She's used it all throughout her career. Um, and Unix culture, Unix has this whole culture going back. And uh, there was this thing called the Editor Wars. It's kind of stupid now, it doesn't really matter. But the two main editors are VI and Emacs. 
And uh, I actually use Emacs with VI key binding, so it really doesn't matter. But Emacs is more of a text environment, which is why I really like it. It has a calculator and a calendar, all kinds of different things in it. And I love something called org mode that it has. It's what I use to make these notes for my speech. Org mode lets you create structured documents all in plain text, headings, tables, lists, things like that. Um, its slogan is your life in plain text. So if your life in plain text sounds like something you might be interested in, then maybe check out org mode. Um, I love it, I use it all the time. Whatever the development environment, um, it should feel like a friend. You should learn its extensions or modes, whatever it calls it for different languages. And you should really learn uh, to work with it. And it should feel like a friend, not like an enemy. You shouldn't be fighting it. Uh, it should be working with you and it, and it should get out of your way and help you stay in the flow state because that's really important when you're programming to stay in the flow state. The last thing you need is your environment jerking you out of it. So then as to the programming language as well, of course, there are tons of programming languages. Um, you'll be learning Python if you're doing the APH course. Um, and Python is a really popular language. Python is a uniquely visual language. Um, the indentation has significance. The spaces and tabs, the white space, has significance. In most languages, it's ignored. It's just there to make it look good for sighted people. And we tend to ignore it. Luckily, editors can take care of it. <laughs> but um, in Python, it does mean something. So it's a uniquely visual language. So if you're trying Python and you're thinking, boy, I didn't realize this programming is so visual. It isn't so much programming, it's programming in Python that's visual. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, don't get discouraged. There are tons of languages and there are plenty of blind people that do like Python. Uh, Orca and NVDA, the two popular screen readers are written in it. Um, but there are tons of languages out there to try. Um, I really like Ruby. I've been using that for a long time. They always keep saying that it's dead, but it never is. Um, <laughs> Um, Ruby is a cool language. I tend to like weird languages. I like a language called Forth, a stack-based assembler. I like the Lisp family of languages. I tend to like these kind of out there languages. But that just kind of goes to what I'm saying is that, you know, different languages make you think differently. They're all doing the same thing ultimately. It's all going down to assembler, down to machine language. But different languages make you think differently. So you really need to try them, try them all. Try a whole bunch of different languages and see what you like, um, you know, because blind programmers, we really have a unique path. We especially, we have our own path because we're doing things differently than everyone else. Uh, you know, we have unique ways of doing things. So you really need to find your own path. Um, you know, instead of forcing a career path, I'd say try a bunch of stuff and find what you like, find what works for you and then build your career around that. You know, there are so many ways, especially with open source software, you can contribute code, you can write documentation, you can help out in forums and in chat rooms. So there are lots of ways that you can get involved. If you put yourself out there, then work will find you. <laughs> that won't be a problem. Employers are, employers are looking to hire. Um, so that's some, uh, some advice. I hope it's helpful. I also, as far as hobbies go, wanted to put in a good word for ham radio. If doing cool stuff with radio sounds fun to you. Um, radio is far from dead. Radio is more relevant than ever. All the cell phones and wireless networking, that's all radio. So you get a license, pass a uh, test, a multiple choice test. I'm sure if you're in this class, you could pass your technician and get on air and start having fun. Um, Another thing that I wanted to just quickly add that really doesn't have to do with computers, but just kind of in general, is that more and more science is now showing that um, some kind of a mind-body system really helps. Something like Qigong, which is what I like, or Tai Chi, or yoga, mindfulness meditation, things like that. There's more and more evidence that shows that this stuff really helps and will help you keep from getting burned out and stay on course and, and manage your energy and your time. Because, um, you know, Learning to program computers is really cool. But once you learn that you can program your mind and program reality, that's really the ultimate. So that is it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Austin. Fantastic and fantastic. And I appreciate the advice uh, throughout on taking care of ourselves in addition to um, in addition to taking care of uh, our needs and learning and our and our professional ability to advance ourselves. Um, yeah. Really, truly appreciate it. 
Um, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely Any awesome. Questions? I think, uh, Denise, did you have something you wanted to chime in with? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to mention there was one question uh, in the chat about oh, how to get started with Linux. Do you have any oh. advice on that? Um, there's a lot of info online now, fortunately. Um, there's, I know there's a blind Linux mailing list, which probably has a lot of traffic. Um, there are some distributions now that uh, will come up that have good accessibility. Um, Debian is a good one, I'd say, would probably be a good one. Arch Linux is also good. And um, there's uh, Slint64, which is based on Slackware. Um, if you've never done anything with Linux, probably Debian would be a good place um, to start with that. Thanks, um, Austin. Orca, Orca is the screen reader, O-R-C-A, and there is a mailing list about that as well, if you need help with the screen reader part. I just wanted to say, um, I've heard a couple of times today how uh, it's really important to just find out what it is that you enjoy doing and then maybe trying to build a career around that. So I love that you uh, reiterated that in your oh, good. talk today, I'm glad others, so Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad others have said that too. Yeah, it's true. There's so much, you know, it's like your favorite food or music or whatever, you know, there's no right or wrong. You just have to find what you like, you know. Yep. Well, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your um, insight. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we are moving on to an exciting element of our program for the week, everybody. Uh, we had those awards. If you uh, signed up for those awards for attending uh, very shortly here with each of our partnered um, companies, we're going to be announcing those award winners. Um, and so we're, we're given a moment to uh, Humanware, Vespero, and APH and all that they have can, can, all that they have provided in this coding symposium from being panelists to speakers to these funded awards and making this possible. We really, really, truly appreciate each of you. Uh, speaking from Humanware is Peter Tusik um, in a presentation, Meet Key Code, an exciting Python editor being developed specifically for blind users. It has me hooked, Peter, I'm ready. Tell me about it. Rock and roll. All right, thank you so much, Adrian. And I am going to share my screen. I'm gonna run a couple of slides. Um, hopefully we'll get us, uh, I won't take a ton of time. Um, I'm certainly gonna to try to speed things up. And then I will be announcing the winner of two $3,000 credits from Humanware. So I will do that at the end of this so we can start to move toward the edge of our seats and get our drums ready. I told Adrian I wanted a drum roll. We'll see if he can actually make that happen. He seems to think he can't. I believe he can. Um, what I'm going to do is share my screen here. And I'm going to make sure this looks good. All right. So, thumbs up. All right, I think we're good. Are we good, Leanne? You are. Awesome, thank you, thank you. So what I'm going to do is uh, talk about a little bit uh, kind of a what we're working on here at Humanware that is directly related to coding. And I know there have been many awesome presentations this week. You've heard from many who are coding directly, um, who are doing it as a profession, who are kind of able to teach or work directly in the field and we just heard from Austin and his awesome advice and kind of how he um, works with coding and things but what we always kind of get into is where do we start or how do we get going and once we do that uh, what is you know what is what is our next step or how do we kind of get our feet wet or get our get ourselves moving in the right direction um, my name is Peter Tusik I am the director of strategic partnerships for humanware I work primarily with our braille and blindness products and kind of also being a liaison with key organizations around the world like APH um, and others who play a big and a major role kind of in what we do and listening to feedback and developing new products. So we have not really heard about this all week, right? What is coding? And I know we all know what coding is, but you know, I, I like to reiterate and Austin made a great point and he talked about that there are all these different languages out there. Um, and you know what what is coding and where, where coding comes into play um, I'm going to be specifically talking about Python today 
which is a coding language that we see very commonly used in education, hence why Humanware is going to start um, with this in, in terms of what I will be talking about. But there are other pieces, right? JavaScript or Java or C or C++ and so on. Um, they're all used to create websites, right? Um, and we really use them to create mobile applications, websites, anything you're using that basically you want to tell a computer what to do. Um, John Gardner on the panel this morning talked about he loves being a coder because if, if a computer can't do something, and I believe Steve also talked about this for those of you who are on the panel, that they can build a program to tell the computer exactly what to do so that it can do it for them. And that's the, the beauty of coding and what coding really is. But there are two main types of coding that is block coding and text coding. And I'm going to kind of talk about what those two pieces are um, and why and kind of what we are doing. So a couple of stats here, and we're always kind of hearing about the unemployment struggles for those of us who are blind, like myself, or, or really, you know, having any sort of disabilities. And we know that it's going to be kind of with us for some time. But in the last few years, we've seen a large kind of increase in the demand for software engineers um, and people who can program or code. Technology is rapidly changing, and this is leading to a shortage. So in the USA, and these are, again, I, I can provide links, but there's about 920,000 coding jobs um, that are unfilled. And, you know, when, when we think about it that way, we realize that this is a huge space that we can all kind of advance in. There are only about 165,000 potential applicants coming online per year, kind of into those 900,000. So we still, there is a long way to go. Um, and we think about the sort of, Americans with Disabilities studies of the ACS saying that about 42% of people are employed with disabilities. And we know that that's a very high number and we hear that number anywhere from 70% unemployment to 50% to who is not wanting to be in the workforce and so on. So these numbers are very kind of subjective to, to the lens you're looking at them through. But what's more important is when, they, when we looked at a stack overflow, um, when they pulled their users, only about 1% of computer programmers were blind that they, that they heard from. So again, if you think of one out of every 100 programmers being blind, we know we can do better in that space. And that is something that we take very seriously. And as we look at the climate and education and whatnot, we think about what we want to build. I want to talk a little bit about block coding versus text coding. So block coding is traditionally what we're using for new coders. So you think about a program like Code Jumper, which is awesome and teaches us concepts, right? It teaches us kind of um, the if then or cause and effect or kind of getting us to conceptualize what coding is. Text coding is often seen as, as challenging. Um, for sure, it's, you know, kind of a lot of words <laughs> um, with, with block coding, whereas with the text, you know, it's things actually being written in, in code. Where block coding has a nice simple approach. It's how we gain that understanding. Um, and the text sort of base coding is what we're going to use though in the real world when we are kind of hired or, or working as programmers. Block coding a lot of times will involve drag and drop. I plug this in here. I move this block to another place. I drag and drop it and kind of fit things into an order, which again is wonderful when we're getting started. Whereas the text side of things really expands your knowledge and you have to think about what it is you're writing. You're thinking, you're taking all of that and putting it into um, a syntax, a very you know, syntax sort of type of way of spelling everything out as opposed to just block coding being words that you can move around. Block coding often has pre-made blocks of code. Again, when we're getting started, we just want to do things in big chunks and that's perfect. But that next step um, is going to give us that sort of text piece is going to help us start to build our skill set and we're going to develop that comprehension of, of, of how we code. Um, with block coding, you're limited to what you have. What blocks are you do you currently have in your toolkit, right? You're limited in your creativity piece, whereas when you're kind of text working with text-based coding, the sky is your limit. You're really going to be able to do lots and lots of coding, many lies, and all sorts of things. A lot of times, block coding can be very challenging from an accessibility standpoint. CodeJumper is certainly a, an exception to this because CodeJumper is fantastic, and you can block code with ease. So Microsoft and APH, you know, having provided us with that product, have done a lot to, to kind of break down that barrier. With the sort of text-based coding, it's a familiar syntax. We're using words. We're, we're using a text editor, right? We're working in kind of with the screen reader, 
um, and, and a braille display and things and working with symbols and, and things, characters and symbols we already know. So uh, talking about some braille tools um, that are currently used and Humanware is very much a braille centric company. So it would be very unfortunate if I presented on something that was not braille centric. Um, like all literacy skills, braille is gonna play a huge important part in kind of developing our coding sort of skills. And we, we know that there are many successful coders who use screen readers um, and, and are not braille users and that's great. And you hear some from some very successful folks this week um, who are not using Braille, but we do believe that one of the reasons, you know, that that number is at 1% is that Braille, we're not kind of promoting that reading of the code as much. So it will help when you're using a screen reader, things can get very jumbled. Um, you're hearing the words can be very, more difficult to edit. And again, reading the world around us helps us kind of visualize what it is we're doing. And again, Braille helps us read that world around us, get the spellings, get the actual characters or cells of where the errors may be located and whatnot. So we always are going to be promoting the use of Braille, whether it's with a PC um, and a, you know, a program online for coding or whether it's something on a note taker, which I'll be talking about, um, that will get us into that Braille first environment to promote coding. Sometimes when you're using those online code sort of editors and whatnot, the accessibility may be there, but the usability isn't always there. So maybe you write your code and you need to flash it or compile it. And when you send it to elsewhere, it's very hard to get to that other part of the screen if you're not you know, aware of where that may be. So again, the efficiency can be a bit of a challenge. So we're really trying to break down some barriers. We are trying very hard to bring things forward and give you the next step after that block coding in something like Code Jumper to look at what we can do. And there have not been any Braille specific tools as of yet uh, that have been created that are dedicated to that Braille first user. And so we are looking for and looking at a program that will be coming this fall to the Braille Note Touch Plus called Key Code. And Key Code would help if my slide refreshed with me. Uh, Key Code is going to be a Braille centric coding application that is going to run on the Braille Note Touch Plus, and it's going to be des designed with that Braille user in mind. So again, it's a Python, it's, gonna, it's a Python editor. Um, you're gonna save .py files, and it's going to give you lots of Braille shortcuts. A lot of times, um, you know, the, 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 the risk is, right, we use computer Braille and different things. Here, we're able to code in UEB, contracted Braille, uh, by, by default. You can certainly use other Braille grades if you would like and you're going to be able to easily jump in and write lines of code. You can open existing code. So if you have .py files, you can open them in key code and you're gonna be able to do things like debugging. Um, you're going to be able to show the current line you are on. So it's very important, the where am I command. If you need to find a specific line, um, it's right in the context menu. So we will have Braille for shortcuts for where are you or go to line. Um, or flash code or compile code. So we're going to be able to create this with our typical Keysoft feel. Um, it's going to be working with Microbit. So Microbit, which I'll talk about in the next slide, is a not-for-profit organization. We're going to be working with Microbit to both adapt curriculum as well as to work directly with the Microbit computers, which are very small computers um, that will hook up to the BrailleNote Touch Plus via USB, and we can send our code to the Microbit and make it do things. The microbit can talk or it can um, give us different pieces to make sure our code works. And it can also then give us, you know, if we have errors, we can find out where those errors will be in our code. So key code, we, we want this to be kind of that next stepping stone, that natural progression for somebody who's stepping out of the block coding code jumper world and saying, I want to go further. Um, and certainly you can, by all means, go into sort of the web apps that are out there and things for coding, but we want this to be a natural progression for a young student who is already using a note taker um, to be able to come with us into this next step. So I have a key uh, screenshot here, sorry, of key code that shows hello world. So again, typing that in UEB and having it shown and we can look at the line numbers and whatnot, kind of edit our code and we can flash it and uh, compile it and flash it over to the microbit computer. All right, finally here, I wanna talk about Microbit. So Microbit is a not-for-profit organization that started in the UK. 
um, and they partnered with the BBC and they were founded in 2015 and they really want to ensure that all children have access to simple ways of creating code and they've, they've put together many many resources and we are going to be looking at all of these sort of resources so we're going to be adapting them for key code users um, making the activities in the curriculum useful so that it's relevant for instance you know a lot of these things are written with the cited coder in mind so they'll say things like oh i don't know make sure you're looking at the third led light and things like that and we want to make sure we can adapt that so that it's more relevant to our users we also want to make sure that the activities are going to be more auditory um, and there certainly are some that are today but we're going to look at adapting many of the activities that are out there on the microbit side of things um, and, and tailoring that to the braille user to the blind user um, to make them more relevant so again learning um, and using that as a resource there are two physical buttons on the microbit computer so there's a and b again when you're writing your code a might you push it and it might say welcome to california that was what i did in our csun presentation and you push b and it might say i like pizza or something like that um, you also have an array of led lights but you can hook the micro bits up to a lot of other accessories robots and other things um, to control movement or you know to, to do to do some of those activities but inside the micro bit computers there is also a compass there is an accelerometer so there are, there are basic things you can do with that code and run it and, and actually have the micro bit do all sorts of things for you um, it will connect via USB. These devo they do have Bluetooth as well, um, and they're going to really allow us to also take advantage of audio because they have a small speaker on board, so that you can kind of send some. It's you know very light and very uh, very very quiet, but certainly there are ways to, to amplify that. But send some text to speech sort of pieces to the devices themselves. So again, being able to actually hear what it is that you're coding in real time, um, and send your code over and, and get it to do things and if the things aren't working that you're trying to program programming programming them correctly again i talk about the projects in the curriculum that we'll be working on tailoring this should be ready by the school year so by september ish um, is what we're aiming for and i'm currently in the process of working on identifying a couple of lessons and things that we'll have that will be ready to go at launch of key code so i'd like to thank everybody for being here and now it will be time for me to stop my screen share and give all of you the two winners of a $3,000 credit uh, that will be applied toward humanware products. I very much want to thank APH. Um, I want to thank Adrian and California School for the Blind and everybody who has invited us to be here this week. And we are so happy to contribute. We are so happy to participate. And more so, we're just fired up about coding and making it more accessible and bringing all of these great voices together that you've heard throughout the week, um, bringing everyone together to make sure that coding is in our repertoire. Coding is something that we're aware of as a profession and as just an activity to help broaden our horizons and kind of broaden what we're being exposed to. So I'm going to stop my screen share. Peter, you and, threw me because let no challenge stand and, and follow through and uh, tell me when the drum roll is needed. All right, so Adrian has found a drum roll, and this is great. So there are two winners, and what I'm going to do is you, I'm going to do my best at pronunciation. So please, uh, please bear with me there. But Adrian, can we get one drum roll, please? Because the first winner is going to be. Oh, I believe in oh, you. What is happening? Oh, there we go. He got it, Alana. Ambrosecchia. So Alana Ambrosecchia. And I did not see Alana present, but that doesn't mean that Alana may not be listening or we will certainly be able to get in touch with Alana. So congratulations to Alana Ambrosecchia. And the second winner of a $3,000 credit to be applied toward a humanware device. Again, this could be a blindness product. This could be a low vision device. Um, we're, we don't just make Braille products. We certainly have a wide variety of pieces out there. One more time. What do you got? Did it do it? Did you hear it? Nope, nope, nope. What? I'm waiting. I said no drum rolls, no prizes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. And the winner is Lisa Salvato. Lisa Salvato. So Lisa and Alana, 
we will be in touch and we will certainly like to work with you to make sure you're getting the best product to fit your needs um, and talking with you about how you can use that $3,000 credit toward a human wear device. And the hope is that you'll be using that device to better and further your coding aspirations. And again, I wanna thank everybody for being here today, for participating throughout the week. Thank you to all and have an awesome rest of the National Coding Symposium 2022 edition. Thank you, Peter. Congratulations, Lisa and Alana. That is fantastic. Thank you, Humanware, for also taking the time now to work with these students to make sure that that device is, is perfect and meets their needs and is just what they're looking for and needing. Thank you for not letting me down with the drum roll. <laughs> moments of success. Big, yes. big moments on small things. I love it. Um, our next presenter is uh, Mohamed Lakar of Vespero. Um, Vespero is a company of products uh, that is Freedom Scientific, AI Squared, Optilec, um, uh, the Paselio Group uh, Accessibility Suite. Um, so Mohamed is joining us from, uh, from Vespero to talk about exciting things that are happening at Vespero, um, as well as announcing uh, the, the Symposium Award winners from, uh, that will be receiving Vespero products. Mohamed, if you could turn on your screen. Um, we will be able to pin you to to the screen. I also see Glenn here. I'm not sure if you guys are doing that, doing it together or not. No. Can you hear me, Adrian? Yes, I can. Would you be able to turn on your video so that we could pin you as well? Yeah. So the problem is my camera is broken. Um, oh. But that's a little unfortunate. I do not have video at this time. We we will. I believe we can make it work by me turning off my video, and then you'll just you'll you'll speak. All right. And, and Adrian, don't pin me. I'm just here as a lurker. <laughs> when Glenn kicks off the symposium and ends it as a lurker. <laughs> Very much appreciated. Thank you, Mohammed and Glenn, for being here. No problem at all. Thank you, Adrian, for inviting us. So can I start? Absolutely. Go ahead. All right. Great. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Mohammed Lashir. Um, I'm a developer working mostly on JAWS, but also a little bit on Fusion and ZoomText. Most of you probably do know about these products, um, but ZoomText is our magnifier, JAWS is our screen reader, and Fusion is surprisingly the fusion between the two. So both magnification and screen reading all in one. Um, I grew up actually on the other side of the pond. I'm from Europe. I grew up in Amsterdam to be spe uh, specific. So. Um, I went through school here in Amsterdam and I went to university in Amsterdam and at some point I lost my sight because I grew up with slow vision as a Zoomtext user and then I lost my sight and I actually, after losing my sight, came in contact with Vispero and moved to the US to work at Vispero at about the worst time in the last couple of decades, uh, two months before the pandemic started. So after two months in the US, I was in my apartment working from home, which was not what I, what I expected. Um, anyway, I'll be talking to you all about our process, and that doesn't maybe not sound very interesting, but it actually is our process by which new features make it into our products. So you've all learned about coding this week, and a big part of coding before you actually start coding, um, and a bit after you've begun, uh, is what are you actually going to code? What are you going to put into your product? What will make your customers excited? And we at Vispera are very lucky with our customers because they are very, very invested in our products. And so they'll give us ideas as to what we should be putting into our products. We have a couple of sessions, some on Clubhouse, some on Zoom, um, and some webinars where we engage with our customers and they will tell us what they would like to see. We also have a lot of internal users and people working on our products who are blind or low vision and who would like to see some features themselves and probably usually create a prototype of the feature and then show it off internally, talk up the feature and say, hey, we should put this in because I find this very useful and our customers will too. And a very good example of that is the speech history feature. I don't know if you know about this one, but if you press insert plus space followed by H when using JAWS, you actually see what JAWS said the last, I think 500 things that JAWS said it is now. And so you can you can move up and down between the, between the lines that JAWS said and you can find something, you know, if, if you just walked away and just said something, you didn't know what it was and you can't find any notification or anything like that, 
um, you just press that keystroke and voila, there it is. Everything that Jaws said in the last minute or two or three or five. Nice. Um, and that's something that actually got created by a blind developer over at Vispero. And it got shown off to our to our program manager and all the all the other people in the team. Mm -hmm. And everyone was excited about it. And we put it into the product. Mm -hmm. Another example, actually, that came in from the customers is a Braille clock. Now, the Braille clock got put in in December, so very recently. And it allows you to put the clock on a Braille display so that you can quickly glance at the time and see what time it is, whether you should start speaking or something like that. Uh, so you can keep track of the time. So that came in through Zoom on one of our uh, many, many sessions with our customers. Uh, we will usually blog about those, so you can join those yourselves as well and talk to us and tell us what you'd like to see. And so the Braille clock, I distinctly remember, came in in August. The suggestion came in August 2021, and it got put into the product by December. So we can move fast once we think that you have given us a very good idea. A fun aside, actually, I got my job to FS Open Line because I joined FS Open Line um, at some point as a customer to complain to Glenn about something <laughs> that didn't work well for me. And Glenn helped me to resolve it. But we got to talking. And you know, at some point, Glenn said to me, why don't you come work for us? Um, and you know, I I was pretty interested to to work for for Freedom Scientific because they made a product that I was very interested in, and I thought that the programming of that product was pretty um, was was a pretty big challenge, and I like my challenges. So, you know, we worked with each other, and I moved to the U.S. and started working for Freedom Scientific. I'm back in Europe now, um, but I'm still working for Freedom Scientific. I'm still happy there. It's an awesome company, and we make some very, very nice products and overcome some very, very nice coding challenges. So now that we've gotten our ideas, we've gotten our ideas either from the people uh, that work at Freedom Scientific or we've gotten them from our, from our customers, now we actually have to decide what goes into the product, and that's the next phase. So we're talking about three phases here. The first one is conception of ideas. The second one is actually planning. So now we have to decide, okay, we are working on our next update. What goes into the next update? What is most important right now? And there are a couple of things that we keep in mind when talking about this. Um, we listen to customers again, because if not just one person has a good idea, but many, many people want something, then we should probably put it in sooner um, because many, many people would like to see it. We also look at the environment around us, and that's mostly, uh, for example, what's changing in the operating system. Uh, a couple of years ago, Microsoft started hinting that they would sunset Internet Explorer, and that's a browser that many, many blind people use uh, because it was really, really accessible. But Microsoft was really hinting that, no, this is not the future. You should be moving to this new browser we made that's Microsoft Edge. And so at that point, we have to start moving towards Edge as well. We have to start creating new features for it or porting old features from Internet Explorer that our users really like, porting them over to Edge so that they work well. So that when Microsoft actually says, all right, guys, it's time, as, is, as they have done right now, because in Windows 11, Microsoft Internet Explorer actually no longer exists. Um, when Microsoft decides to move, we are ready. And most of our users are ready because they have, in fact, already moved themselves as well. So that's, that's something really important that we also keep track of. And then the physical environment as well is very important, like the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic made working from home a lot more important. And so we started developing features for working from home. And one of those is the sound splitter. So the sound splitter allows you to move sound from JAWS to one ear when you're wearing headphones and sound from the computer to the other ear. And that will allow people to better decide, okay, well, to better listen to both uh, both sounds. You can have JAWS talking while I'm talking and you won't get confused. A lot of people asked us for that. So that's actually a combination between a lot of customers asking for it and the physical environment changing such that it becomes more important to put that feature in. And so last summer we worked hard and we put in the feature. Um, Right, so 
we have now decided what goes into the next update. What are we going to do now? Well, now we're going to develop the feature. And the feature, um, the feature that we're, that we're going to talk about in terms of what happened when we developed it. And the reason why we're talking about this is because I worked on it. Um, so I know about the nuts and bolts um, is a new feature actually that comes in in June. June 21st is the release uh, planning, but um, and it will have a new feature called the notification history. And the notification history will allow you to look at notifications that came in today or yesterday. And you can actually decide how JAWS reacts to those notifications in the future. So I know if JAWS just keeps saying something that you get really annoyed by uh, and you don't want JAWS to say it anymore because you know you can make JAWS, you can go to the notification history feature, select that notification and tell JAWS, you know, I don't want to hear this, just mute this, but do show it on my real display. Or, you know, I want to know that it occurs, but you don't have to tell me, just play a little sound, play a little ding, and, um, and then I'll know that the notification has happened, but I don't have to hear you talk all the time, um, telling me about this whole long notification that I already know what it says. So, that's a new feature that we've worked on um, and that will come in in June. And what, what happens when we start working on this feature? Well, you know, the first phase of that is to start designing the feature. And we have people who specialize in UX and UX, I don't know if you've heard about UX, but UX stands for user experience. And user experience means, is it nice to use the feature? What will I do to use the, what do I need to do to use the feature? So it's a keystroke. Well, okay, what will be the keystroke? Is it easy to remember? What will be the buttons that we put in? How do we label the buttons? Um, is it clear what we're saying? Um, you know, only today actually I was browsing a website and I found a button with the labeled text button, which is not very helpful. <laughs> so JAWS actually went over that button and said button, button. Um, and you don't want that. So that's something that you have to think about like, okay, I create a button. I write, I, you know, I say what it does. Um, and that's what, what these people are very, very good at. This is a very simple example, but of course it gets a lot more complicated once you start designing whole UIs. Um, and then after that, we start implementing it and actually testing it. And then we come out with things that are useful or not useful. And we start removing and adding things. So for example, the first thing we started adding was a silence notification button. So you would select the notification, you would silence the, you would click the silence button and now the notification would be muted. We ended up though removing that button. And the reason why we did was maybe not very intuitive, but you know, once we started testing, we decided, well, I mean, what do I mean by silence? Do I need to silence the, do I need to, do I need to silence the speech? Do I need to silence Braille? Do I need to silence both? What am I doing here? And so because we could not make a text that was concise and clear, we removed the button. Um, and so these considerations are very important to think about as well when you start designing something. Um, there's another one, and that's the sound card selection feature. I don't know if you know about that one, but it came in a little bit later, oh, no, a little bit earlier in the summer. And it allows you to switch over to a new sound card once, uh, once you find out that, for example, JAWS is silent because you put in some headphones and you can now no longer hear JAWS because it got confused as to which sound output it to use. You can press a keystroke to, um, <clears throat> to switch to, to another sound output device. And we added that as well. And we actually, the only thing that we got in was a question, can you guys add this, but nothing else. And so this is a smaller feature and it came to me as a developer immediately. And so I looked at that and I started designing the UX for this. So it's not just those specialists that decide how the UX should work. It's also developers when they are working on something, you know, you have to think about how you are going to make this work well. Um, and so, you know, you look at that and you, you come up with the UX that makes sense. And I came up with the UX to use a list. Um, you, um, you basically, 
um, press up and down arrow to move between sound cards. And when you've done so, you can, uh, Jaws will speak. And once you hear Jaws talking, you're good. You have selected the correct output device uh, that you want it. And this is really useful because of course, lists are all, all over, um, you know, any computer system, both on Windows, on Mac, on the web, and users are very, very familiar with them. Now, actually, Adrian, I want to drum roll as well because there are some Vespera prizes to give out. Of, of course, of course, of I, course. I, I lost my prep here. I, I will get back there. All right, so the first winner of the Vespero $3,000 credit is Brian Flores. Congratulations, Brian. And the second winner Vespero $3,000 credit prize is Logan Barantes. Ooh, so congratulations, Brian and Logan. You both get a $3,000 credit towards any Vespero product. Uh, we will contact you um, with more information. Um, Wonderful. We see we see a teacher who has Brian, uh, a teacher who's here right now who has Brian, and I see Logan Brantes in the audience right now. Uh, congratulations, Brian and Logan Mohammed. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely love to hear how uh, Vis how Vespero and Freedom Scientific continues to evolve Jaws in all of your products. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for uh, yeah. inviting us, Adrian. Please pass along the thanks to to the entire company. Um, this field is is not the same without Jaws leading the way and without um, the rest of our screen readers looking at uh, Jaws as a stabilizing force and trying to emulate it and become better than it and do all the things that they attempt to do, which makes our accessible toolboxes all the better. I will certainly do that. And thank you for organizing this. Of course. Adrian, it's Glenn. Somehow my audio got shared. And so I think people may have been hearing my audio throughout Muhammad's presentation. Is that correct? No, you're you are all right, Glenn. Oh, cool. OK, then we're good. Thanks. No snafu. Um, Thank you, guys. Our next presenter is Greg Stilson. Thank you, Greg, for your involvement thus far in the coding symposium. Greg is going to be presenting on APH's Road to Code. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I am getting a notice that I cannot start start sharing. Uh, so I don't know. You can now. Hey, beautiful. All right. So. I am going to go through APH's Road to Code. Um, so if those of you who don't know me, I run the Global Technology Innovation Team here at the American Printing House for the Blind. Um, we sort of do a, a cross-section of a number of different projects, from partnership projects to our own apps and things like that. We are a team of technical product managers, uh, quality assurance analysts, and software engineers. and so. What we have here is what we call the road to code. And the road to code is really, we, we always start with what's the challenge or what's, what's the, pro, uh, the problem that we're, we're, we're trying to, uh, to solve. And really what it is is that students today are le learning coding and, and uh, coding concepts at earlier and earlier ages. And unfortunately, a lot of the tools that uh, mainstream classroom teachers are using um, are generally not accessible, right? Um, so coming up with sort of alternative ways or working, uh, one of the things that APH does really well is is partner with mainstream companies to try to make these um, these products accessible. Um, you know, there's there's very few hands-on mani manipulative tools. We we all know that young students learn concepts uh, exceedingly well when they actually can get their hands on something. So you know, creating uh, hands-on manipulatives and things like that. So we we want to be able to bring those sort of coding tools or the 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 tools that can teach those concepts and put them in the hands of students with visual impairments as early as their sighted peers. So. APH's Road to Code is really a, a set of accessible coding tools that uh, grow with the student. Um, so we want to make sure that we have options for all ages and grade levels um, and really create a, a coding progression from one tool to the next um, so that they can 
do uh, utilize one tool and then be able to move on to the next one and learn either either learn a new skill or apply the skill that they just learned in a different way. And ideally, these are tools that can be purchased on quota funds, um, and they are uh, tools that really are inclusive to both students who are visually impaired and uh, their sighted peers as well, because we don't want to be using tools that are uh, really specialized for the, the student with visual impairment, right? They want to fit in with the rest of their class, their classmates as well. So I'm going to quickly go through because we're trying to jam pack this into 15 minutes. Um, so I want to go through sort of our, our road to code high level product. So it starts off with the code and accessible code and go mouse. And this is a really fun product that you have a, a product that is, looks just like a computer mouse essentially, and you program it using an up, down, left, and right arrows um, and a couple other buttons to navigate uh, a maze that you create. So you build a maze out of these, these tiles and walls and tunnels. Um, and you, you get this, um, this, this toy mouse, essentially, to navigate through this maze to find the cheese. And you have to do it by programming it using um, consecutive instructions and things like that. And it really creates this sort of um, computational thinking, right? OK, you have to do this before you can do that. Um, and if you do something wrong, it'll bounce into a wall. So it's very clear that you you did something wrong. So then you have to go back and debug it and things like that. So it's a it's it's been a really fun product to see um, to see being used. The next one is an iPad app called Code Quest, which is a very similar type of concept. This is a, a, an app that basically it's a free app that you can download that um, you're a little spaceman uh, or space person that is navigating. Uh, to try to find his spaceship, essentially, or their spaceship. And you have to do very similar processes. You have to tell him to go up, down, left, or right, um, and, and navigate through the maze until you find uh, the spaceship. But it, it basically takes what we do in the physical world of the Code and Go mouse and puts it in a digital world on the screen of an iPad. And they're both meant for, for younger students, I would say. You know, um, uh, I've got my five-year-old. For example, playing with the Code and Go mouse, she loves it. Um, and then, you know, moving into the uh, into that same kind of age range for the Code Quest app as well. Then we move into Code Jumper. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Code Jumper. Basically, taking the concepts of block coding and putting it in your hands and with physical pods uh, to create things like songs, stories, to create the concepts of loops, constants, um, uh, you know, if, if else statements, things like that. Um, I'm sure we've 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 gone through many uh, Code Jumper lessons already. Some of these you may not be as familiar with. So the Snap Circuit Junior Kit is really a, a, an electronics kit that teaches students about circuits, um, currents. It gives instructions for 101 different projects that you, you can do. And what we've done is we've worked um, with the, the company who designs this um, to really I would say many of these these electronics kits, when when a, a sighted kid gets them, a lot of them is you know you you put these wires together and it says okay your end result is the light bulb goes on. Well, that doesn't really give any um, response to the blind user that they did something correctly or incorrectly, right? So what Ken Perry and the team have done here is they basically have revamped these kits to be entirely non-visual and then also created the instructions in a non-visual fashion so that um, a, a blind student is able to, to create these circuits um, in, uh, in entirely independently if they want. Snapino is really focused at the middle school student. It introduces them to the Elenco um, or I'm sorry, sorry, the Arduino environment. Um, you want to create circuits with speech. You can create um, early early electronics with some coding skills as well. So um, these these the rest of these products kind of build on each other. So then we have the the RC Snap Rover. So this builds on what we did with the uh, the Snapino and uh, Snap Circuits Junior uh, projects. So you're you're continuing to uh, use those skills, but you're kind of expanding the number of projects that you can build now. So you can build things like FM radios, digital voice recorders, uh, little alarms, doorbells, things like that. Um, it really expand, expands the amount of uh, parts and pieces that you can use to, to build these projects. 
And then brick structure kind of combines all of the, the previous uh, electronics works that we have with actual physical blocks that you can build, um, you know, a, a number of these brick builds with the various circuits. Um, you can almost create little robots or moving parts that you you uh, you can do. So it it basically takes all of those concepts that you learned in the in the early kind of stages uh, with with it takes all the stuff you learned with Snapino or Snap Circuits Juniors and then you can build it and build it and build it. Um, and it's kind of cool because when a student masters the first um, you know several several products now you can build upon the knowledge without them uh, needing to go go learn an entirely new kind of infrastructure like that so um, so that's our road to go road to code as is we have some exciting stuff in the works uh, as we always do um, we recognize that there are holes in in this road to code we are missing some pieces related to you know there's a big hole between code jumper and then actually physically writing code in an editor and so aph is looking into to solutions there to kind of pull somebody from code jumper into other tools that can get them to uh to the actual act of writing writing code but we are incredibly excited about the road to code especially with as early as um, sighted kids are learning coding um, it is so crucial that that our blind students are able to to learn using those same mechanisms and now i'm going to ask that adrian hits the drum roll thing again because um, i know you're all fired up about that and uh, we're going to announce two of the aph winners uh, for three thousand dollar credit towards two aph or towards aph products Go. <laughs> so the the winners are that that did not go well. Adrian. Wasn't a good one. No, it did not. <laughs> Jim doesn't like noises that aren't built in. No, what? no, it does no. So Jamila Conde uh, is the first winner. And Elijah Garrett Murray is the second winner. So that is up to $3,000 towards an APH product. Congratulations. It has been truly a pleasure and an honor this week to be part of this, uh, this coding symposium. Um, and, and I urge each and every one of you to, uh, to pursue your, your coding dreams, your coding goals, and, and find somebody that, um, that's done it before. Don't try to invent the wheel. You know, piggyback off of the, the, the the things that that other people have done successfully so thank you so much uh, for joining for spending your time on a friday with us and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again thank you greg um i didn't realize that drum rolls would be a competition but vespero well played in providing your own drum roll and shocking the system and making it work oh leanne did it leanne what and you, you didn't you didn't give it to your own APA? I couldn't. He was sharing. Can I can't share? Oh, <laughs> Only one person can share at a time. So here's the thing. Next time, I will build it into my PowerPoint. This, is, uh, this was my go. own fault, my own issue. I'm, I'm usually, I've got seven backups on top of backups. This was my own, my biggest miss. I did not realize that we could not uh, share audio on a drum roll that Zoom would be smarter than me and be like, that's not your voice. I <laughs> could have called that. Well, <laughs> so, so the drum rail rolls failed, but the symposium did not fail. I really, really appreciate everyone that was uh, a participant. But first and foremost, we have a correction um, before we move much further along. Uh, we had a little technical glitch um, on our end with announcing one of the award winners from, uh, I believe it was from this Humanware. 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 Um, one of the award winners from Humanware was a teacher, and we did uh, apologize, Lisa, for, for you not being eligible for this award, but we tried to make it very clear on our website that these awards were for students. Um, and so our award winner uh, for the Humanware Award of a product um, up to $3,000 in value is Henry Zimmerman. Henry Zimmerman is the correct additional award winner from Humanware. Our apologies. We are going to wrap things up. Um, I know myself, uh, Leanne and Denise, I, I'm sure will say something too, but uh, I want to first and foremost thank uh, our colleagues at APH 
Um, Leanne has been here at the forefront of it, but there are so many people at APH who made this happen. Uh, a lot of them you saw, some of them presenting, but a lot of people behind the scenes who brought the 2022 National Coding Symposium to life. Uh, I'm not going to name you all, but I hope you I hope you hear me. Uh, you are very, very much appreciated in making this beautiful thing happen. Uh, Denise Snow, uh, absolutely fantastic, uh, handled the vast majority of organization and planning and connecting and making this come to be what it is. Denise, very, very much appreciated, very much respect you and everything you've done for this. Um, thank you. Thank you, to, uh, thank you to our partners at Schools for the Blind across the country. That not only uh, that not only made activities happen at their sites and around their states, but wrote the activities. In many instances, we had schools for the blind that created these activities. Um, thank you to uh, the centers for the blind as well. Not just the schools for the blind. We had centers for the blind around our country uh, that made this happen and put together our our pre symposium days. And and I've heard from many post symposium days to come, where they're bringing coding to life for students in their states and around their centers. Um, our presenters from literally all over the world. Uh, we had multiple presenters this week that were not only from the US, but from other countries around the world. Thank you very, very much. Um, and to our participants, I uh, truly appreciate that you were here and that hopefully the speakers and panelists and presentations this week uh, motivated you in some way, shape or form, um, and that you are inspired to take your next your next small small step or big leap um, into the world of technology uh, and coding and whatever code you might choose with whatever tools you might use. We heard uh, from everyone this week that can be anything that you're on the right path just by trying. Um, so thank you. Uh, on behalf of myself, Adriana Mandy at the California School for the Blind and all of us at CSP2, thank you for your participation. Truly appreciate it. Well, Adrian, I think you covered most of the folks. The only person, the people I would add would be the students that um, presented throughout the week as well. And, and really appreciate you guys being here and making this more interactive for all of us. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Very, very proud of all of you. And Leanne, I think you might have some closing words. Um, I am going to wrap it up them. saying it's not the end. It's the end of the coding symposium, but we are continuing on with STEM this summer for students. So if you are a student or you have a student or you have a friend who's a student, realize we are offering free virtual STEM camp this summer, the week of June 13th through 17th. We are having the great camp, great STEM camp out for grades kindergarten through three and a symbolic learner camp called Tending the Garden. This is where we'll explore math and science. Uh, the camp out will figure out how to decide what you bring, what decisions you make for building a place to sleep. Our Tending the Garden will learn about area and perimeter and pictographs and learn how to plant a garden and build a virtual salad. And then July 23rd through the 29th, we'll have two different camps. We'll have STEM camp on a deserted island. That's for fourth through seventh grade. Learn how to build a waterproof container, how to construct a sleeping area that stays dry, and other scientific practices for planning. And then the afternoon for, for eighth through 12th graders plus, we are having crime scene investigation camp. You are going to learn about uh, how anthropologists determine the age of a skeleton, how to have the steps of a crime scene investigation, develop your research skills, figure out what happened. And then the first week in August, we are going to have Oreos and Abakai camp. You are going to work on spatial relations, measurement, and algebra, all while talking about Oreo cookies and those funny little beaded things that was mentioned just earlier on the abacus. And last but not least, our August 8th through 12th camp will be all in Spanish. We will have STEM camp on a deserted island for all ages in Spanish. So I hope you will stay tuned, join one or recommend one, even if you're at a camp does not mean you can't come to our camp too, because it's virtual. That's fantastic. What an offering. Uh, thank you for sharing all of that, Liam.